Chair of the Finance Committee for the Hoyoke City Council, members of the committee with us this evening for this Zoom meeting, which is being Zoomed on the public access channel, channel 15, and being streamed. Members of the committee besides myself are Councilor Leahy, Present. Councilor Sullivan, Councilor Bartley, and Councilor Tomlin, are you here? I'm Councilor here. Councilor Tomlin is here, sorry. Oh, I see it, Peter. Uh, other members of the council who have joined us, Councilor Murphy, Councilor Lisi, Councilor Graney, and I believe I have everybody for the moment. I'm sure a few more will be joining us soon. Uh, we do have a, a bit of an aggressive agenda, but we've taken some moves to uh, both speed it up and to make it doable. So, so Councilor Graney and anyone interested can see that uh, kickoff later this evening. But we do have some important items. And to begin with, uh, just in case, I put item number one on the, on the, uh, on the agenda. It's been on the agenda for our last two meetings. It's an application for a secondhand license for uh, for Mr. Jonathan Maldonado of 385 Main Street. 385 Main Street is where the application is for. Uh, we were we were giving, and, and Mr. Maldonado gave no other contact information, and we've been having trouble getting hold of him. Is Mr. Maldonado here, or Jeff? Do you have any updates for us? I did, I did send another letter to the address uh, last week. Um, I haven't heard anything. Um, I will also mention that um, I worked with the city clerk and she said that she was adding new fields for contact information onto that application for the future. And to show, we've, we've, if I could, uh, Mr. President, right. um, if um, you know, we have had it on the agenda for some time now, um, doesn't seem like this person is interested because he would have uh, a attended the meeting or b he would have looked into um, uh, into it. Um, so I think at this time, just make a motion to give it to leave to withdraw. I'll second that. Um, I I, have, I agree that we we should take some action on it this evening. Um, we cannot give something leave to withdraw without the petitioner's approval. So I suggest. I guess the, the one option or one option we have is just to deny it for lack of participation by the petitioner. Okay. I make a motion. I deny, I'll rephrase it. I make a motion that uh, we deny it because of lack of participation. Second. Uh, any discussion? Yeah. Mr. Councilor Chair. Murphy? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is uh, a property that has been. Uh, totally neg neglected for quite a while. I do know that Mr. Maldonado, when he first filed this, uh, and I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say it was late summer, but I'm not positive on that. Uh, uh, you know, he was at the city clerk's office uh, and he also, uh, you know, we had the fire department go down and, and look at the building. And it wasn't right then at that point, they were not able to say they could approve it at that point. Uh, but then he was going to go forward, and and I know, I mean, I I was under the assumption that the city clerk had a different address, a, a residential address to go along with the business address. So, I mean, I I, I don't know the person. I only know that uh, you know they were trying to move the process back in in the late in the late summer, early fall, and uh, again, if they could do it. It would certainly, if they could do it and it was going to be a viable business, it would certainly be better than what's there right now. I don't, I haven't had any contact other than that with him. Uh, but uh, if that's possible, uh, you know, I know Jeff said that uh, the city clerk thinks she's going to have a different contact information. I would just say if we give him, if we have a different contact information, give him one more chance, I would appreciate it. Otherwise, we're going to have a building that's still going to be vacant there and, uh, between uh, Hamilton and, and Cabot Street. And uh, Mr. President, if someone wants to make an investment, hopefully they can. Councilor Graney. Mr. Chairman, yeah, quickly, I agree with Councilor Murphy. Give the guy one more shot, see if we can get a business there, see if we can get him there. Uh, I mean, uh, we gotta give everybody every every possible chance we can to uh, to improve the situation in this city. So we can delay it for another two weeks or a month or whatever it is. Just give the guy another shot. Thank you. All right. I, I, you know, I'll withdraw my motion. 
Well, motion is withdrawn. Uh, I'll just say I have no problem giving the applicant multiple shots, but we have no way of contacting this person. If someone that is asking us to give them another shot could contact them, I'd there appreciate it. And the inform we're not gonna get contact information, Councilor Murphy. We're, we're asking for future applicants that they be there there be an extra window added to give us contact information. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll, All I'll, right. The only, the only thing I'll try to do, Mr. Chairman, I you know I'll go and knock on that door again and try. I, I've never been able to see somebody in there. I just know that they were there the time when the fire department went down to inspect. Uh, well, maybe Jeff, maybe we can reach out to the fire department and see how they got a hold of them. I can do that for you. Okay. With that in mind, I guess we're going to give Mr. Maldonado one more shot. Everybody in agreement? Yes. Motion to the table for the next meeting. All those in favor? Aye. Thank Aye. you, Aye. So move. Thank you everybody. Aye. It is Aye. worth a shot if we get them. Item number two. Motion to take item number two off the table for discussion. Motion to second to take item number two off the table for discussion at the request of the school department. The city of this is an order filed under my name to initiate an MSBA project. Uh, abbreviate reading, I hope, is that the city of Hoyle can appropriate the amount of $270,000 for the purpose of paying the cost of conducting a feasibility study to identify the improvements and the updates for three school roof replacements, which would be the, the Sullivan School, the Dunahue School, and Ian White School. Um, this is, a, as I think most of us are familiar with how an MSBA project works. Uh, with this this evening is Whitney Anderson, uh, who is the go-to person when it comes to uh, any facility projects with the schools. And uh, we also have Anthony Soto, who we know is the expert on the, the budget uh, situation with the schools. And is anybody else with us, gentlemen? Brian, nope. So with that in mind, the chair would ask that we allow Mr. Anderson and Mr. Soto to make any presentation necessary, and then we'll open up for question and answers. All those in favor? Any uh, questions, right. we'll move. Wendy, thank you for oh. joining us. Did you want to be the lead person here? Joe, before, uh, we, before we start, could I ask a, a question about form here? Uh, Councilor Sullivan with a question. Yeah, so the, the order says that the, the city of Holyoke appropriate the amount of I, I thought we couldn't appropriate, the city council couldn't do that. So we have an order to appropriate funds. Well, it, it comes underneath my name, but the language is the language that bond council puts in front of us with the mayor's signature. Whenever it comes under the chair of the finances name, uh, nine out of 10 times, it's the only way the mayor can put something in front of us. Okay, so this is coming from the mayor. All, all appropriations, all transfers, okay. any bonding, all comes from the mayor initially. Okay, thank and you. We are part of the appropriating process, but we can't initiate it. Yep, thank you. No problem, Good. it's a good question. Mr. Anderson? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I would ask uh, Anthony Soto to uh, give an overview in regards, from his perspective, where this project, these three, three projects lay, and then uh, I could pick up any detailed questions mm -hmm. from there. Anthony, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. Um, so, you know, over summer. the summer, over the summer, we um, we we had uh, actually last spring we had brought forward to the city council a request to submit um, for uh, four roof replacements and a boiler um, and the MSBA had approved um, us, had invited us and approved three of our roofs. One of one of the roofs that was not approved uh, didn't meet the criteria of being at least 30 years old. So um, the three that, that were approved were Sullivan Elementary School, uh, Donahue and Ian White. Those, those roofs are all, um, you know, at the end of their, their, uh, their useful life it, and with the MSBA program, as many of you know, um, different than the core projects, the accelerated repair projects have had a history of, of, of 
funding uh, 80% of the project. They're very, 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 very close to it. Um, so what we're asking for is, is for us to move forward with feasibility um, so that we can get, you know, the scope of work aligned and, and get an idea of what roof replacement would cost. I think it's a great opportunity for the city to, um, to replace three roofs that are at the end of their life um, and only uh, have to foot the bill for 20% of the cost. Whitney, I'm not sure if you want to add to that. Excellent. That's a great overview. And that's, that's realistically, these costs, uh, these budget projections for the feasibility uh, apportionment presented before you tonight come from my analysis of historic MSBA costs, MSBA costs in relationship to what other communities have experienced for design feasibility, as well as the uh, overall scope of the work itself, which is dependent upon the square footage that we would, uh, would find necessary for replacement. So this will get us in a, in, a, in a great ballpark of number one, participating with the MSBA process. We've just experienced this invitation as of a month ago. We're approaching the council on near record speed here as far as having time to go through the subcommittee analysis and not just present it to the full board for a, a very hasty type of an approval. So I appreciate the fact how this has come forward already. And now we can, uh, if there are any questions in particular, that's about all I have to add at this moment. Tom, in the, the 270 gets us into a design phase the feasibility study, as you're as you're calling it, and it then goes, if you know that goes forward, do we have any estimated cost on the replacement of the roofs? I can speak specifically in regards to that, Mr. Chairman. What happens is is that the MSBA is very specific as far as this accelerated repair program in relationship to the base age of the various components that we hope to replace. We've done some boiler jobs. Last year, we did some window replacements and exterior doors. And these roofing projects are part of that accelerated program. This is separate from the building replacement program, which is an entirely different opportunity. So in this regard, uh, the roofs needed to qualify with a 30-year minimum age. Some of these roofs are over 32 years. The ones particularly that are 32 years only had a 15 year warranty. So we've gone well beyond their expected lifespan, which in essence is savings for the city. There is a slight compromise when we have to do more repairs, but we've been able to keep the ship intact at this point. So when we get to the point where we have done, when I first came on board, which is 25 years ago now, uh, Jack McDonough had gone through another campaign to replace all of the roofs in the district. These roofs specifically did not qualify at this time for replacement. Now from these, and I, I don't wish to confuse the issue, but I think it's pretty straightforward. At the three schools that are before you now, a portion of the roof area that you will see from above is 25 years old. At the same building, a portion of the three schools you will see from above is 32 years old. So we have been invited in to participate with the entire roof system here. So as we go further in the line of conversation with the MSBA and have a very close inspection from the architects in regards to the overall nature of the roof systems that are on those roofs that are less than 25 years, we will see specifically which end of the spectrum we come out on as far as the overall cost of the project. If we just do the areas that I have submitted for consideration with the statement of interest, it's approximately seven to nine million dollars. If we go ahead and, and follow through with the entire scope of the entire roof area of the buildings, it's approximately 12 to 16 million dollars. So there's, there's a range there based on practicality. I can tell you that if we were only to do a portion of these roofs, two things would be dependent. Number one, we would be reinvited into the program in 10 years to do the remaining sections. That's my professional opinion of approximately how long the existing surfaces 
we'd be able to maintain them for without replacement and we would be invited in to participate into the system so it's it's a little bit of a challenge there we know how uh we, we've been very fortunate with our immediate needs through this accelerated program to be invited to participate to be timely in our record keeping and to be good stewards of the building so the the msba is really looking fondly upon Hoyoke. we've been invited in as as part of 18 other communities out of 400 in the commonwealth and so it's it's quite an honor to participate at this point and uh, so that's that's the range i hope i haven't gone on too far but that gives you a a view of where we're able to so as the architects look at things the bottom line here we'll be able to come back with a firm budget once this initial initial process is complete is there a contractor or is it going to be an in-house uh, feasibility study the feasibility study will be done as required by the uh, msba through a owner's project manager any project above a million dollars requires us to solicit and to utilize an owner's project manager and also a design architect with the uh with the with the opportunity that we have before us in relationship to the um this particular need the and the program that we have here with the accelerated program the msba supplies us with an opm and a designer we do not have to solicit through an rfp so those help us along with our timeliness and they also give us an opportunity to move right ahead. So initially there's an OPM to help us get the paperwork in proper order and a designer to look at the scope of work and to estimate the budget. Lori, welcome, you're muted. <laughs> Good evening, Councilor. Lori, I think um, we've gone through enough of these projects and uh, Whitney and Anthony certainly given us the basics and and we appreciate that. Um, I'm sure there's going to be some questions in a moment, but I just wanted to touch base with you. The uh, the $270,000 portion, we wouldn't necessarily go out and bond for it. The treasurer would be able to uh, to use a bridge gap or you know, a, you know something until we get to the point of where we have a project in front of us. Am I correct or? I believe we could bond for it. I know generally on the feasibility studies, the city's reimbursed at 80% on the study. In terms of financing that, I believe the treasurer could either bond for it, it could be incorporated in the budget. I know we have budget talks coming up. Uh, I'm not sure what that looks like. Well, we, we need the bond, but the actual bond itself, I don't think she would go out until the feasibility study was completed. She could use the uh, I, think term what's, borrowing. I think what she does is she sets up a band, yeah. which is, you know, which gives us um, the coverage to be able to financially do the project. And I know that there's a lot of paperwork that goes back and forth between the MSBA and the city and the contractors in terms of reimbursement and signing off and things of that sort. So um, I think, you know, Sandy would then issue a, a, a band to be able to uh, you know, to cover that until everything is completed. That was the terminology I was looking for. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. With that in mind, we have a project before us. It's an MSBA project. As we all know, in order to go forward, we do have to approve something that would be the funding, although the 80% is uh, what we're all looking at for the, uh, the, the, uh, the, both, the both the study and the uh, eventually the project itself. Is there any discussion from the committee or other members of the council? Councilor Sullivan. Yep, so um, I guess this would be for Whitney. Um, the 80% number I'm hearing from Laurie, so we would get reimbursed 216,000 on this from the MSBA? That's correct. Uh, even if the project didn't go forward? That's correct. All right, so what we're really on the hook for is $54,000. We're being invited to participate in their program. Their program would start upon our commitment to that. Yeah, so, but if if for some reason we get turned down, I mean, that that's our gamble here. We're putting down 54,000. We're out that whether it goes forward or not. 
We're putting down no, that. That's correct. For a shot at 12 to 16 million. That's correct. Okay. Um, so I, I guess my next question would be for Laurie. Um, uh, we're, we're talking about um, bonding. Why, why would we bond for this? Um, uh, well, maybe, maybe this isn't for Laurie. Maybe, maybe Joe can help me with this one. Is that the only op only option or would this be a good use of stabilization? Or do we have enough in free cash? Um, and then how long would it take to get the 216 back? Um, that's a good question, Councillor Salvin. There are other options. Uh, I think the reason, and I'm not going to speak for the mayor, but one of the reasons that we go this route is, and I, and I thank Laurie for the language because I couldn't quite put my, at the tip of my tongue, is we're, you know, we're looking at $270,000 to complete a feasibility study with a design, you know, designer study portion of it itself. We, we need to, to guarantee that the city is guaranteed that that money will be paid by upfront by, by bonding. Now, if we, if we were to transfer money, appropriate money from stabilization or from the city budget, that would do the same thing. But in this case, we're not gonna be spending money until it, it, the, uh, the cost actually incur, which, you know, and then eventually, I don't think stabilization is gonna pay for a, a nine to $12 million project to replace the roofs. So it becomes one bond that carries over into the project itself. And eventually we, we get the reimbursement as we go. So the bonding takes place. This is what would have happened, what does happen with any of the MSBA projects. And we get the 80, what we have to pay on a given year, once the bond is out there, the MSBA reimburses us for 80%. So they would be just reimbursing us a portion over a 20 year period every year for 20 years as as we go okay all right and thank you mr chairman Councilor Salvin, is that yep that that answers all my questions okay Councilor tom and then Councilor grainy thank you mr chairman uh this question is for whitney whitney um if the vote goes through um tonight and, and then to the full council what is the time frame uh, for you know the the work with the MSBA and when they could possibly start the uh, the roofs on the buildings. Thank you, Council Tomlin. The uh, the requirement initial requirement for submittal of this certified vote to the MSBA is February 14th. After that time, they will go to their full board, see the fact that we have complied with the initial uh, measures that were required. And now they will assign to us the OPM and the designer who then have four, four months approximately to uh, go ahead and uh, do their work to investigate and to make recommendations, do financial analysis. And from the time of invitation, we have 180 days to get back to the MSBA. It could be earlier, but then they would certify at their full board their next uh, normal full board meeting, which happens quarterly, uh, the next one's the middle of February, to inform Hoya whether or not we have been invited to go ahead and proceed with the actual project. So at that time, then we would uh, put the project out to bid and go forward. So most likely it would not be this coming summer, but the following summer. Okay, and uh, maybe this question is for you also, the uh, the time period for the, the bond, is it usually 20 years or is it more than that? Uh, depending upon the uh, the best financial ability the that the treasurer has and the auditor and the bond council to recommend to the city to save the most amount of money. And, and as a project goes on, the money from the state would be a, uh, reimbursed on a yearly basis? Uh, it's reimbursed on a monthly basis monthly. in increments of greater than $50,000. It's an electronic transfer that happens directly to the city's accounts. Okay, thank you. I'm it's, known as, it's known as the ProPay system. We've utilized it on uh, three or four separate projects now very successfully. Okay, thank you for that information. Sure. Councilor Graney? Yeah, um, uh, through the chair, a uh, question to, to Whitney, not a question, but just an explanation. Could you please explain to the public exactly what the and who the MSBA is and who exactly gets the 270000 
Sure. The uh, the process is is one in which the state has made provision, and this is perhaps something that Anthony could speak better to, through the Department of Revenue. And the Department of Revenue has funding set aside for purposes of in, inviting the local 420 some odd school districts to participate in this program based on their income per capita eligibility of which Hoyoke is reimbursed, they say, at 80%. And consequently, what happens is they are the oversight organization, the Massachusetts, Massachusetts School Building Authority, that then oversees, invites, authorizes, certifies, and approves, and then actually reimburses communities for new schools and for repairs to existing schools. So that's who they are. And who cashes the check for $270,000? The check for $270,000 is used to pay the professionals that number one, help us keep track of all the financial paperwork and the regulations required in order to participate in the program, those are the OPMs, the owners project managers, which are required by the state. There's a lot of paperwork. And then the design architects who spend hours, and this is their profession, to, to draft drawings, to quantify and see existing conditions of the proposed work to make specifications and recommendations for the best materials in order to renovate these systems in question and then to bring forth budgets to for review for the council and then further recommendation to the MSBA. So that's who this money goes to, those professionals that are paid in order to participate in helping us figure out our project. And those are all selected by the state, correct? In this instance, <clears throat> excuse me, with the accelerated repair program to save us time and to allow us a, a quicker turnover, those OPMs and design professional architects are provided to us ahead of time. Thank you. You bet. Councillor Leahy, then Councillor Bartley. Dave, you're on mute. Oh, we got them both on. Both I, I'm on mute because I wasn't recognized. It's Council Leahy's recognized first. Jim, can you hear us? All right, we'll come back to Council Leahy. And uh, Council Bartley, you will be yeah, next. Yeah, Joe, I, I, I got to take this call, but let, let me let me just, I'll, I'll be right back. No problem. Council McGivern, fill in the gap. <laughs> I love Zoom. Uh, I did want to announce, and I think Anthony will too in a minute, but the uh, the superintendent, our receiver, is at the school committee meeting, and the mayor is at the school committee meeting. And if anybody has any questions about that, I'm actually looking right at both their faces on Zoom on channel 12. I, I love Zoom for some reasons, and for some reasons I don't. Um, there's a lot of good questions and a lot of things that we are discussing here. Uh, I, I know this council is very familiar. It's, we're not green with MSBA projects after the Linky projects go through with the uh, middle schools. But is there any other questions at the moment? Council Leahy, are you with us? Jeff, is he frozen out or is it just? We're not all sure. All I see is his background picture. That's all I see and everything else is muted. But he had, a, he did have a hand up. Perhaps he's all set. And uh, Councilor Murphy's hand is now up. Oh, well, Councilor Bartley's back, so I'll defer. Councilor Bartley's now back. I'll go, for, go ahead, Terry. I'll, I'll wait. I, I was I was delayed. My fault. Thanks, okay. Joe. Just no uh, a couple of things. So, Whitney, I think you, if I heard you correctly, this uh, feasibility study will be done this spring. Yes, uh, the the deadline for submitting the certified vote, which which is what we're uh, uh, working on now, is February fourteenth. 
and then after that period it goes and, and there's also a maintenance uh, questionnaire that I have to fill out for each and every school yep. which is fine that's very standard for us <laughs> and then from there then what happens is the board receives that information votes whether to proceed and then allows us to go ahead and uh, to to continue on from there mm -hmm. so then from that time uh, we have 180 days from our, our time of invitation, which uh, which was December 14th of this past year, and uh, six months. So so we've got six months in order to come back with the completed feasibility study, and then to submit that to the MSBA, and as well as to uh, come before the the council, referred to committee, back to the council with an estimate of the scope of work to be performed and then to present to the MSBA our willingness and desire to proceed with that and the opportunity for a reimbursement or if for some reason we decide not to then that's also our prerogative okay and the other and I think you I think you also said that the assuming everything goes the way it's ex you're expecting it to go the feasibility studies yeah let's get this done I think you said it would not be till the summer of 22. That's correct. At, at this so, point, yeah, the the bidding process takes a little while, and, right. and as well as uh, it, although the roofs themselves, it, there is you know again I, I like to hold out all types of hope, and that's why we're really uh, we're ahead of the game now as far as times are concerned, um, and depending upon his, how this proceeds in the next full board, and then our ability to go ahead and uh, submit this paperwork, uh, we'll look favorably upon uh, you know possibly holding out some hope, uh, but it depends on the MSBA's turnaround for this particular okay. summer coming up. Okay, and the last question in terms of the, the structural structures of the roofs right now, are there any of those that potentially could have some serious issues in the next year? Well, we always, we monitor the situations daily. Obviously, you get a deluge of rain, you find a couple of areas. If the wind's really blowing, it makes for some interesting opportunities for water to be pressurized and then to enter in places that normally doesn't. So we're, we're always working towards uh, doing some repairs. It's a blessing actually in the winter not to have a huge snow load on the roofs. Um, not that it's a detriment unless it gets really deep, but it uh, also allows us to do repairs in these months when normally we can't. Okay, and then there. you also said that some of the structures are more than 30 years old and some parts are not, but they will be in the future. That's and right. you're hoping that they might include that. I'm, I'm gonna make an assumption and I'm certainly not anyone that uh, is a construction expert by any means or even a novice, but I would assume that doing it all at one time probably would be cheaper uh, than if we come back five years down the road and do the other parts with that uh, you're, the costs are escalating anywhere from three to four percent per year so you're absolutely right okay okay so i'm assuming we probably would try to go for everything uh it it does make sense the more we talk about it yes okay thank you you bet Councilor barley thank you uh, sorry, th sorry for uh the interruption but i had to take that call um uh, yeah, yeah, Whitney, well, welcome uh, back. Uh, congratulations on your uh, impending grandchild. Very happy to hear that for you. Thank you, too, uh, to, Yeah, to, to your wife, too. Um, awesome. uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, I'm going to step back here a second. Uh, I'm just going to make a brief I'm going to brief comment because I want to follow up on Councilor Murphy's uh, statement. Um, and then I'm going to ask some questions, uh, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so we, we heard that a couple of years ago that, that getting things done now is always going to save money. So we, that was the argument we heard about the two middle schools. Uh, we, we heard that uh, two years ago. So get the cost done now because the, the costs are escalating. And, and we saw the public's reaction to, to that argument. Uh, that, was, um, that was vaporized by the public. Uh, so that's my comment. The first question I have, and, and, I, and I, I, this is just for, through the chair to uh, Whitney. Um, who, who made the determination on the, on the three roofs? Um, I, I, I see the age, and, and that's that's concerning. Um, are they all in equal disrepair? And uh, so, once you answer that first, and then I'm, I want to go into a few more questions in that regard. Well, certainly. So, 
again, uh, you made a comment, your initial comment was regarding the middle schools. I have some thoughts in regards to that, but I'll hold my opinion at this time. Uh, in regards to the three schools that have been selected in re regards to replacement of the existing features on the roofs, again, the Massachusetts School Building Association Authority in regards to accelerated repair projects do have uh, a, a very finite channeled opportunity for the school districts in the Commonwealth to take advantage of this program. Number one is for replacing heating systems and only those that are within the, the, the boiler room, if you will, none of the peripherals. And number two, windows and doors, and number three, roofs. So mm -hmm. we've, done some, we've done some beautiful work with boilers. We've eliminated a lot of concerns. We still have some other concerns. Number two, we did some beautiful work, thanks to the city's support in regards to window replacement and door replacement, Kelly School, Morgan School, mm -hmm. Sullivan School. You, you, when you go by, you can be proud of the buildings that you've invested in there. Uh, by the way, the city has over a half a billion dollar infrastructure there, so we do really appreciate the support that you offer these and taking advantage of these programs. The roofs, in particular question, again, I'll mention to you, these were roofs that were originally put on 1989 and 1990 with a 15-year warranty roof. We've been blessed somehow or other to have these things last for 31 and 32 years. And we've been trying to take very good care of them. We have a certified roofing company that does uh, warranted repairs whenever necessary on any of the square footages within all 1.1 million square feet of the school district. So we stay on top of these things and we try to take care of them. So the ones that came up that were selected by myself and, and, and then presented to school administration through Anthony Soto and Receiver Zurich at the time were ones that qualified for the MSBA roofing accelerated repair program replacement opportunity. And that's how they came about, Councilor Barley. All right, so what I'm, what I'm hearing you, you say <clears throat> is, is that this program is here now and let's take the opportunity. Is that, is that fair to say? This program has been in effect since the MSBA, the MSBA has a, had a rebirth and the rebirth occurred as we had approached our Coyoke High School renovation in 2009. Prior to that, there was a moratorium. The funding source originally came from the Department of Education and it was bankrupt. They had spent too much money and were a half a billion, they were $500 million in debt. And then from that time, the, 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 the uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts had to come up with a new plan in order to fund this. And they put a penny on the gas tax in order to put approximately $500 million a year in circulation for use and distribution through the MSBA. And so consequently, at that time, the reinvigorated program came about, as, uh, counts, as uh, Chairman McGivern will tell you, we used to receive 90% reimbursement in the city of Hoyoke. After the, uh, the new and improved MSBA, we only got 80%. So at that time, this is when they came up with a, a, a green initiative program that went by the wayside. They came up with a science lab initiative. We took advantage of that and that went by the wayside. That was $2.5 million. We stretched that out due to other communities not participating in the program to over $7 million we put into Dean School in 2013. The accelerated repair program came about through the, the, the realization that many of the schools did not need to be torn down within the infrastructure of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. They just needed to be repaired. And the common area is the first common area is the roof, and then you have the heat, and then you have the windows and doors. So this is a program I believe they're gonna stick with. There has been a tremendous amount of participation. So as that happens, there will be fewer and fewer schools that participate, but there still is an active level of participation across the Commonwealth. I do see it as a program that will continue and perhaps expand into the future. The only thing, you know, the only thing I would add to that is um, that, you know, Whitney and I sit down every single year, and right before the MSBA ARP uh, project window, we take a look at we have a we have a capital plan that stretches out a few years. So we, you know, we know what we would likely be looking to do if the msba program continues next year we have we prioritize them based on you know what what the most immediate need is 
but uh, I do want to uh, uh, I do want to mention that how we got here was we we don't we're, we don't go and apply for an MSBA project without getting approval for the council. So these schools that are, are the projects that you see in front of you today, we had gone to the council uh, last year and sought permission to apply for the for this ARP. And that's what you see in front of you. They, they, they reviewed the five schools that are the five projects that we were looking to do and they denied two of them and they invited us um, for these three. And then so have, we had come to the council, asked if it was okay to apply. We applied and these were the three that were approved. And now they're asking for us to move to the next phase. Thank you. Uh, okay, so um, so I, I'm I'm hearing what I'm what I'm hearing is that the let, let me put it another way. Um, which of these three, Whitney or or any, what what what's the put? Have you ranked these out these three these three rules? So in other words, what, which one is more critical than the other two? Are they all equally critical? Sullivan School has buckling insulation underneath the membrane and is failing. Um, Ian White School suffers from the same area and it also has microbial de uh, degradation on the PVC surfaces. And then uh, Dunahee School is suffering from that similar type of uh, insulation degradation. So they're all pretty bad. They have uh, failures within certain aspects of the flashing components. Some of the repairs that were done uh, have been up there for 15 years or so and they're starting to fail and need address. So. So there, there's a, we've, we've done specific uh, studies uh, as of two 2019 in regards to each and every roof's condition through a certified roof company that offers us this service and also does repairs on the roofs. And we, we keep them going and uh, with repairs, but also take advantage of their service to give us an idea of the longevity we can expect from these roofs. So anywhere from immediate replacement as needed to two to three years to three to five years in some instances across the district counselor um the um the statement of interest is is, is that i have it written in the order that it's a feasibility study and then and then i then i heard what you said earlier that it's it's somebody who's preparing the the financial package so but when I hear a feasibility study, uh, I, I think that in terms of, of uh, well, tell me, what, 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 what would you, how would you describe the statement of interest that we're putting forth, forth to the MSBA? It, it is, it, if it's a feasibility study, is it feas in, in terms of the financing part or in terms of, of the need? Because what you, what you just described in the last two minutes, Mr. Anderson, is the actual need, which I didn't hear that before. So I, okay. that's why I asked the question. Absolutely, um, and I'm, I'm glad you did. Right, well, yeah, I, I appreciate that. Uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure you're going there. But I, I just want to get it on the record, so, so I can understand it uh, a little bit better. And then on top of that, you said that you said that you have um, uh, professionals, uh, professional roofing, roofing companies, um, uh, uh, supporting your assessment. So your professional assessment is based on your. 30 years on the job, and then you have professional you know, roofing company backing up your assessment. That's, that's what no, I it's, it's not backing up my assessment. It's an independent assessment performed by a third party. Even better. Even better. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm not a certified roofer. I, I'm a construction supervisor licensed to Commonwealth, but these people are specifically uh, roofing yeah. contractors. So what happens is the once you obtain an invitation into the program, and pre-qualify through the age of the elements that the that the Massachusetts, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the MSBA program traditionally finds that there are very high failure rates after 35 years for boilers, 30, 30 years for windows and doors, and 30 years for roofs. It, that, that's pretty much the outside end of things as far as what we can expect from these types of systems is that the next process in their language to comply with this invitation is to do a feasibility study. Feasibility study is a professional, again, independent assessment through design architects that are certified through the Commonwealth licensure process to analyze the existing systems, to quantify the exact scope of the job, and then to specify suitable and best 
practice recommendations for replacements of the existing system. Removal and replacement, any hazardous assessment, asbestos concerns, so forth and so on, anything that could come up with the job. And then to put a price tag on it in their estimate based on the fact of what their national estimators and their software programs as they do their digital design really is what it comes down to. Uh, we'll, we'll put forward a set of blueprints that then are all electronic these days and then can be quantified for the total cost of the project and brought back for recommendation and, uh, and consideration by yourselves. Right, and so, so I, and I just want to ask another question or two, then I want to ask a question to the chair about something if I, if I can, uh, Mr. Chairman. So when you said earlier, you, you, you gave two ranges, a seven to nine million, 12 to 16 million. I'm not holding you to the specific numbers. That's fine. But, sorry, did I say something? No, sir, I, I agree uh, with you. Oh no, okay. So yeah, so so you said you you gave you know, okay kind of two right. Just go over for me again. What is this? The, the seven to nine million is 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 what, and the twelve to sixteen is is what? Just what? What are those two pockets? So here's here's what happens is the the state has a web portal and through the MSBA and as I am is authorized to enter information into that portal, they have a series of questions that they ask. And some of those questions are specific to the school, others are generic in nature, depending upon the scope and the size of the project. So on, on February 4th, 2020, I submitted statements of interest based on a desire to proceed from the council to the MSBA in relationship to participating in five different opportunities for us in the accelerated repair program. So as I enter the information, some of the specifics require square footages for the size of the building and also uh, compliance with the prerequisites of age for some of the infrastructural components we're talking about as well as the opportunity to quantify all of that and so when i do that i if i have a roof two different roofing systems on some of these buildings some that were replaced 25 years ago 25 and a half years ago and others that were replaced 32 years ago the ones that are 25 years old don't pass the test. But as the process goes, and from February 4th of 2020, when we made application, and in November, when the Mass DOT avionics division came out here with drones and flew over our building and took 200 independent snapshots and quantified all of our information for the MSBA's consideration, we were given permission and authorization and invitation to participate in complete roofing replacements. So my documentation initially filed in February of 2020 says that it's a smaller project. The MSBA has said, go ahead with the whole thing. And that's the range. So the range for the initial statement of interest from February 4th, 2020 was a smaller project seven to nine million dollars for the square footage is in question. The larger figure of 12 to 16 million dollars is in relationship to the entirety of the, all of the roof square footages at those three locations. Okay, uh, all right, and then uh, just to thank you, um, and, and then to, just to, just to, uh, to, the, to Joe. Joe, um, was, was Sandy invited to this? I I don't think so. Uh, and, and I just want to ask you another question, Joe. So, uh, so the reason I, I I try to get you know just drilling down on this one, I I wanted to uh, just just get a, a better feel for the need, and and I I did. Um, when we're when we're talking about the bonding, Mr. Chairman, um, sh should we not have some input from uh, from the city treasurer relative to the impact um, on the on this? You know what these bonds would do to our our current financial situation and the you know, repayment of the bonds, ability to bond further. Should, should we have some? Uh, should we? Uh, you know, and, and I know we're we're probably going to vote on this on the 270. I, I know you want to get that that going, but um, what what I I think we I think we I think we're ahead of the game here. I I, I think the the gentleman said February 14th at MSBA, so. Um, so we've got a couple city council meetings between now and then. And I'm just wondering if, if it would be a good idea to hear from Sandy Smith, uh, the city treasurer, to, as to whether or not we should uh, 
you know, what, what impact? I mean, it, whether it's seven to nine million or 12 to 16 million um, there's on that part. And then also I, I wouldn't mind asking her is, you know, do we actually have to bond for the, for the, for the 270 right now? Can, is, can, can we get her opinion on an alternate means um, b before we, before we take that vote? That's, I was wondering if you can answer that for me. I'd be happy to, to give you my answer. Um, and it's certainly, you know, my own, um, you know, experience in, in what we're doing here is yes, you're, you're, you know, as far as Sandy coming in for the full project and the impact that a 12 to $16 million or a seven to $9 million project would have both on our bonding, our payback schedules would be very important. Um, the, to me, I look at this as the, the initial step to get to that, that project. Um, I, I, I don't think the $270,000 as I asked our, uh, as I asked our purchasing agent, Lori, you know, answered is, you know, would be a band at this point, you know, which would be over the next year and a half, two years as this study takes place. We are not committing to the full project. Um, I, I think we are, you know, in my own opinion, um, recognized by what we've already heard from Mr. Anderson is that these three roofs need to be replaced. Um, and it's not just his opinion, but an independent study of it. Um, we know that the MSBA doesn't invite everybody into the accelerated program. Uh, we have qualified for something uh, that they've, they've allowed us or allowing us to go forward after asking for their, their, initial, uh, their initial review of the projects. And I think the steps that we take right now are to get us, to keep us in front of the MSBA and as we do that, as we approach that down the road, 180 days to make a decision, we then, you know, have the, the treasurer, uh, the auditor and, and bond council, probably too, Councillor Barkley, you know, to, to weigh in on all those questions. But I, I don't, I think it might be, it wouldn't be wrong to ask at this point, but I think it might be a little immature to ask the, uh, those type of questions at this point without knowing what the full scope of the projects are going to be and what the estimated cost of the projects are going to be. I, I, I hope that answers your questions. They are good questions. And I, I certainly think that we will address them as time goes on. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Motion on the floor then is that we adopt the request before us uh, refer that recommendation to the full city council next Mo Motions to recommend adoption. Okay. Is there I'll any further that. discussion on the motion? Motion made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. So moved. Thank you. Uh, Whitney, can you hold on for a minute? And Anthony, are you still with us? Yes, I'll be, I'll be here. Okay. Yes. So we, we have the uh, next item, which is not related, um, but goes hand in hand. It's a, it's a, we go to the item first. Uh, this is item number three on the agenda introduced by Councillor Murphy. I think some other people may have signed off, but Councillor Murphy was the initial uh, maker of the order that the mayor, the receiver, meet with the finance committee to update the city council on the potential of receiving MSBA approval for building one new middle school with the MSBA assistance. Please provide any update well, the status of the proposal and the financial implications of, of any approval. Um, you know, I, you know, listening to Councillor Murphy and and speaking with him, and the, and the receiver was before us a couple of meetings ago, where he did list the uh, middle schools as a priority in uh, what would become his tenure. Uh, I think this was a an appropriate time to get Councillor Murphy's on the agenda, at least for an initial discussion. Uh, the mayor, as I, I did say, stated a minute ago, uh, begged off with a conflict with the uh, the school committee, which I did uh, not too long ago see him on the Zoom with the school committee. And I think Mr. Uh, Soto, Anthony is with us, and certainly Whitney to uh, help and to address any questions with this order. Um, certainly, tonight's purpose is for discussion and uh, maybe some ideas about how we should be going forward with this, knowing this, any type of proposal with the new school building is major and uh, takes a lot of uh, a lot of input from different uh, different angles. 
So with that in mind, the chair will entertain a motion to take off the table for discussion. Make a motion to take it off the table for discussion. Second. Made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The chair will defer to the maker of the order to uh, start us off, and then we can hear from uh, our officials from the school department. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, the order is pretty self-explanatory. I mean, I think uh, based on uh, what happened in the last year and a half, two years, I think you know the, the general consensus was let's let's see if we can get one middle school together, not one giant one, but get a middle school back together. We, I know, last. Uh, January of 2020, I believe we had a, a meeting. I met in the mayor's office with several other people uh, because we were trying to get back in front of MSBA and they were trying to let us get back in line. And it sounded like they were trying to let us get back where we would have a chance to be uh, being considered for one middle, one new school, more than likely a middle school. Uh, and I was under the impression that that would potentially be decided uh, this year uh, and then see where we go next year. Obviously, we need to know if, in fact, we've got any information in terms of that. And if so, uh, what the timeline is for it and uh, what the finances, financial situation would be for it. And lastly, uh, if we are doing that, I mean, where are we going to locate it and how are we going to do it? So there's, a, I mean, I think it's a, it's a crucial issue that needs to be uh, put forward. I mean, clearly we've got uh, a need for some additional uh, school space. Uh, the, it sounded like in February of last year, MS, MSBA wanted us to move forward on it. And, and you know, up in the last nine months, I have not heard anything and maybe I've just missed the, the discussions. Uh, and that's why I put the order in. I think we need to know where we are. We need to have an idea what the cost is going to be. We need to understand how can we, how the bonding would be, and how we're going to be uh, getting reimbursed, and then what percentage we're going to get reimbursed. So, I mean, again, I think it's an issue that the community wants to work together on, and I think it's very important that we work together on it to come up with something that we can all agree on. Uh, and, and so that's why I filed the order. Uh, I mean, obviously education is crucial uh, in improving education in any way we can uh, uh, and we can afford that, then I think we should be moving on. So I just wanted to get an update and, and if the update says we're, we got things pending, then let's get moving on getting the pending to be actual in a, into action. Thank you. I think it's a very good order and uh, some fantastic uh, questions and thoughts about, you know, if we are going forward. I, I think the big question that we have is, is not just why, but how do we go forward involving not just the city council, the school committee, the school department, but uh, also the community at large too. So Anthony, are you representing the receiver on this order tonight? Yes. Uh... Whitney and I both are, and I'm okay. going to let Whitney speak to where we're at um, in the process. Um, in short, uh, there's a board meeting in February, so we do have an application in, and we won't hear into, uh, what, whether or not they, they're going to invite us in until the quarterly meeting, which is going to happen in February. Normally, we would have known by now, but with the pandemic and everything going on, they just haven't been able to meet. Whitney? Uh, yes, that is true. And when Anthony and I spoke in regards to this, uh, Chairman, today, uh, I was not counting properly on my fingers because I just looked up at my uh, calendar here and the announcement at the last quarterly board meeting from the board of directors of the MSBA was on December 16th. So three months from there is actually March 16th. They have, uh, the, the last word that we have received in writing from them is no action will be taken prior to that time. And uh, there were no guarantees when that communication was received that action would be taken on that March 16th date either. So we're a little bit up in the air. They have, as I mentioned to you, um, with the accelerated program we just discussed, no one even came to our facility other than the uh, mass dot 
avionics division. Uh, one of the people in particular of the two that were here was a C-5 pilot out of Westover formerly, and now he flies drones, which then allowed them to have a remote analysis of our facility. So I, I think it's been very challenging with the MSBA in regards to their ability to conduct their normal day-to-day -day affairs in a, in a timeliness of which they have been used to and have historically pursued. And so at this point, we are holding for any notification or invitation into a statement of interest, which I filed on behalf of the city's request for uh, the opportunity to, again, enter into this program, which they call the core program, which involves replacements or major remodeling additions and renovations to existing schools. Whitney, the, the core program obviously is different than the accelerated program. Yes. Could you just be a little bit more detailed into what is expected at this level in terms of being invited and when do we have to do a more uh, detailed, you know, one school, two schools, what do we, you know, you know type of uh, proposal? That's right. Uh, the, uh, the core program itself is the way in which the MSBA acknowledges a community's desire to update, change, modify, renovate, redesign its educational opportunity for their citizens. So that's a big bunch of words, but what happens is, is that the, the MSBA actually requires the district to perform an enrollment evaluation and projection to make sure that what we are looking at is something that will meet the needs of the community. As Hoyoke knows, we've had charter schools, we have parochial schools, we have a variety of opportunities out of school placements and so forth that dict exactly how many actual places we need to have in our various infrastructures to allow children of the community to get an education. So we have to do an education enrollment plan, uh, projections in regards to exactly, specifically the conditions and the eight different criteria that the MSBA has for these core programs, whether we're suffering from overcrowding, structural concerns, immediate needs of repair or restoration, um, and, and three or four other criteria that just go into greater detail in regards to our existing infrastructure. We also have to file a maintenance plan to m make sure that the community is doing as much as can be done to keep up the existing infrastructure and not to be lackadaisical requiring removal and replacement of, of good components. And that's been my calling for these years. So we, we do the best we can for deferred maintenance, but after a while you say, well, here's what we need to do. The MSBA in its oversight anticipates, and I had alluded to it previously with our conversation, that the mechanical components of our different structures will last about 30 years. So that's 30 years for boilers, 30 years for pumps and, and different plumbing fixtures and things like that, and 30 years for windows and doors. And we're not talking about bricks. We're not talking about the structural components because they can last, they estimate, up to 50 years. But as you and I know, what we've done for the city of Hoyoke in, in what we believe to be a very prudent uh, opportunity to take advantage of our high school. We put approximately $25 million into a facility which now is worth $125 million. And so we were able to take advantage of a, a wonderful structure and to perpetuate it. And so this is what they allow us an opportunity to do, is to look at our infrastructure and to make improvements in that regard for the mission of educating our students into the future. So I, I hope that kind of focused a little bit in regards to what their approach is. They do have specific chronologies and timelines which are unique to the, the larger projects and uh, through an invitation to the system and to the, the, the program that they provide to us, then we would have to utilize services of our central procurement office and RFP requests for proposals, uh, uh, owners, project managers, and they would compete for our 
business, our opportunity to serve our, our community. And then from there, we would collaborate and then request design services for architectural um, analysis of this opportunity, such as what we had done previously. Thank you. Right. Laurie? Right. Thank you. I just, while we're having this conversation, I just would like to offer um, something as I think an idea as we go forward because I know we're trying to be ahead of things and after having participated in the last um, experience of trying to get the, the middle schools off the ground um, I wonder if there's an opportunity uh, because the city has the CPA if we might have an opportunity to potentially um, ask the state for an exemption to maybe take some of those CPA monies and put it towards funding the schools. I know the schools are not part of the three original um, uh, sections, you know, uh, open space, affordable housing and conservation. Um, but I think with um, certainly uh, uh, our financial situation, our schools and receivership, the need is there. Um, I've been thinking about this since you know, really last November of trying to look outside the box a little bit. And I wonder if at some point maybe we could um, invite Representative Duffy in and Senator Velas in to see if that's even an opportunity um, to kind of offset, uh, you know, some of maybe some potential act tax increases to f finance the whole, um, the, the middle school. So I've been thinking out of the box and I know this, the state is very strict in what you can or can't do, but I continue to um, try to push a little bit, um, think out of the box, maybe we could get a local sales tax, a half, a per, a half cent mm -mm. added to the gas tax or something for funding purposes. I'm looking, this, my idea right now is strictly on the funding piece because I think that was the biggest hiccup um, the last go around. And I would welcome any opportunity to participate in that being on the front end of it and having these kind of discussions so we can maybe look at, are there any other opportunities and other ways we can kind of um, either create new funding streams or petition the state to allow us a little bit more local control of the funding streams that we do have in place. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie, and uh, good questions. I know Mike Sullivan's our expert with CPA. I don't. I think those are, are down the road answers we'd be looking for, but uh, certainly if, if we even thought there was a door to open, we could bring in uh, our, our state delegates. But Mike, is that something CPA's talked about at all? Uh, no, not really. Uh, I'm really not quite certain that's within the scope of CPA. It may not be in the scope of the CPA counselor, but you know, you could maybe, I mean, if we don't ask, we don't know. Yeah. Um, I think I, I have said all along, and, and when we started this process, I have said all along, we, this city has very unique and challenging circumstances and we're really constrained by, I feel some of the rigid rules from the state. So, you know, if, if there's an opportunity to to maybe shave off a little bit of some of the CPA money that can kind of go into uh, a capital budget for the schools, that would certainly, um, I think, take take some pressure off the taxpayers. Or I'm not sure what the budget's going to look like down the line as well. But if we look at that as just something to talk about, and, and maybe it would work, maybe there's some communities that are talking about adding schools as another tier on top of the open space, affordable housing and conservation. Um, you know, is there a way that we could generate a local, you know, add a little bit on the meals tax, add a little bit on the, on the gas tax that's dedicated for this specific project? I'm not sure how that works on the state level, but again, um, I'm just trying to think outside of the box of you know where we can kind of maybe hopefully and potentially capture some some uh, financial support to help with these projects. Um, I'll suggest on this topic it's a good topic to get out of the box thinking that we'll get Amy to do some initial looking at this, and uh, certainly we can either use the law department or uh, or 
contact uh, the uh, Senator Representative uh, offices to see what they think. But Lori, we will we will keep it open and uh, certainly see if we can get some answers. Um, Mr. Chairman, Councilor Murphy, I, I, you had the floor. Do you, if do you I want can to continue? Just... If I can just finish here, I just want to, uh, after listening to, to Whitney, I mean, my hope is that the MSBA is going to recognize that we've gone through all of this process just a couple of years ago, uh, and that they should, in, in to a great extent, waive a significant portion of that process as long as we are looking at something very similar in in terms of the buildings in one of those spots uh and recognize that uh you know we're doing what we can potentially uh have uh, affordable in Hoyoke and acceptable to the to the people of Hoyoke uh and that they're not going to make us go through and hire new people to to tell us yeah that's the design of the school that we've already had people designed uh we've already got all those things and if the MSBA and I, I remember them at the Charter and Rules Committee meeting telling us this is what we've approved. This is what we've approved. Uh, you know, two years or not even two years later, I would hope they're saying, "All right, let's get at least one of these going. Let's get this done so that we don't go through this whole process, and maybe uh, we can be in a situation to start looking at something maybe in the spring of '22 where we can actually start doing something." So I, and I know Whitney, you, you don't have any control of that, but I'm telling you to tell the MSBA that I want them to do it. Absolutely. <laughs> I think the first Mr. step is getting Chairman. invited. Okay. okay. And, and I just, you know, again, I just think this is important. I think we need to move it. I'm glad MSBA is going to take it up on, on March 16th. And hopefully they're going to say, you've done all the work before that we're accepting that work before. Tell us where you want it and let's go. And then let's go back to the people. Let's get everybody on board, and let's get something going. Like I said, hopefully in in nineteen twenty or nineteen twenty two. That's my age coming up there in twenty twenty two. Thank you, Councilor Sullivan. Then Councilor Grady. Yeah. Um, th thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, address a couple of um, Councilor Murphy's questions because I was on the uh, school building committee and also you know, met in person with the people from the MSBA. Um, first of all, they, they had already agreed to give us, uh, you know, put us right to the front of the line and give us uh, you know, the, the fast track, if you will. Um, and they've been very accommodating, very supportive as far as that goes. Uh, what I think is gonna be the problem is any exi and when they said that, th that was based on all the initial work we had done, a lot of the existing plans. <clears throat> I have a friend that's on the board of directors at Bentley College, and I asked him how, how this COVID crisis was affecting them as far as the learning goes, and he, he says that it, it isn't affecting us at all. He says uh, seven, eight years ago, they, they've been on the front edge of technology for years and years now, and they'd gone to uh, hybrid learning and remote learning. Um, the, the stuff that all of us are trying to learn now, they've been doing for years. Um, and and not, not to get too far off that, how, how it's really affecting them is in the tens of millions, uh, even hundreds of millions they've invested in other facilities to attract people to the school, such as athletic fields, gymnasiums, swimming pools, hockey rinks, things like that. Um, that are, are no longer as valuable or supportive an asset for bringing the students in. But ha having said that, what, what we submitted two years ago, I have a feeling we're gonna be back, uh, back on the drawing board almost from scratch when we're thinking about the size of the classrooms, the new technologies that are evolving and everything else. I, I don't think we can rely on any of the previous work that was done before, that this is gonna be a new process and what a school looks like in the future is gonna be very much different um, than what we saw just two years ago or even a year ago or even 11 months ago for that matter. Um, uh, so it's, it, it, we're gonna be back on the cutting edge of something and a design phase for the future that's totally new. And that, that's 
once again, my opinion, um, and it, it's based on some research here and just watching what evolves right now. Councilor Graney? Yeah, two points to make. Maybe the, uh, the, uh, the, the supplementary parts of a school building, such as an athletic field or a playground could, could possibly qualify for uh, CPA fundings. But in addition to what Councilor Sullivan said, we don't have a crystal ball. So there's uh, a lot of things that we need to know, especially I don't know what the, what the enrollment of the uh, Ohio Public Schools is today or what the middle school enrollment is, but certainly we're gonna need a study as to what the projected enrollments are gonna be over the next five years as well. So those are all things that we need to consider before we go forward with this project. Thank you. Points well taken. Councillor Tallman. I got it. Okay, you hear me now? Yep. You're good. Okay, thanks, Mr. Chairman, and, and thanks, Terry, for bringing this forward. I think it's very important, uh, the educational process uh, of our students uh, in, in our community. It's uh, education and, and schools are one of the most important drawing facts, uh, drawing places uh, for, for people to move into our community. So um, uh, I'm glad that uh, this we're in line for this. I think uh, uh, we should try to get as moved as this is as, as fast forward as we could um, once we find out by the MSBA. Of course, it's gonna have to get some community engagement. Uh, we saw what happened last time. I, I think uh, you know the, the two schools were a good plan, but the, uh, the voters just didn't uh, buy it because of the cost. Um, so we have to look at everything now this time out. Um, you know, is it affordable and can we build a, a school of the future as Councilor Sullivan stated, uh, something that's state of the art that is gonna take us into the next uh, 30, 40 years with, uh, with new technology. So I, I really appreciate the discussion here and, and the thoughts and, uh, and, and really uh, want to commend uh, Councillor Murphy for, for bringing this forward. It's something that we definitely should start, start to think about uh, for the future. Uh, just anticipating the, uh, the possibility that we'll probably table this with me, Anthony, um, would, would it make sense that we revisit this when the MSBA uh, reconvenes in February and, and we can get an update from you? Yes. yes. And what I, what I be looking for, and I, I don't want to speak for Councilor Murphy, but, but certainly for myself is how we involve the community. We, start, we should be getting ready to start talking about, you know, the type of uh, committee that we're going to put together. And, and I know mm -hmm. I think that's why the mayor was invited tonight. And, and certainly we, uh, we have to anticipate that we do a better job of, of community involvement because eventually we're going to have to decide how to fund for this project. And uh, I, I'm reserving any comments on 80% because I was kind of hoping, you know, you, you've heard it how 2020, you know, is over. 2021, 2020 beat us. I was hoping 2021 we're going to hear some good news about that reimbursement formula, but it sounds like that the, uh, the, the state is not paying attention to the gateway community known as Hoyoke and other gateway communities and our financial needs and, and the formula doesn't meet what our financial affordability is, but that's not for tonight. But does that make sense that we get an update, right? You know, when the MSBA is reconvened? Yes, I believe so. Councilor Murphy, anyone else? Yeah, I, I think, you know, putting it on a table until after March 16th uh, and, and know what's happening there. But we, I would, again, encourage that we start having some kind of meetings, trying to get community together. I know the mayor's got to put a committee together and, uh, you know, all, all the signs were that there's gonna, they're going to approve something. So let's let's start working on it. But no as shame. far as this order, let's table it and, and, and meet again after we know what MSBA has decided. Before we make that motion, Whitney, you, you, you weighed in. Anthony, anything else to add? Lori? No, nothing else. I think that's a good idea. I think uh, we, we'd be able to update you further once we know from what the board's decision is in uh, February and whether or not we're invited to participate in the program. Okay, thank you all.
I didn't the chair entertain a motion to the table. Motion Make a motion to the table, table to order. Second. All those in order, all those in favor. <laughs> all right. Aye. Any opposed? So move. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Whitney. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you Anthony, much. Whitney. I appreciate thank it. Thank you, Whitney. Hey, Ms. Uh, before we go to item number four, just real quick, there's a couple items for the DPW coming up. There, uh, one was introduced by myself, and one and which I want to make a, a very, when we get to them, a very brief uh, report from our from our superintendent of the DPW and where we are. And the second one introduced by Councillor McGee. Mine was on vehicles. Councillor McGee is on. Uh, sidewalks and roads and stuff, which I think we, we visit about this time of year, every year. Um, Mike McManus will not be with us this evening. So those items, just so everybody knows, five and six will be very brief and pro possibly laid on the table. And that's just housekeeping. So if anybody's waiting for those two items, I want you to know up front. The next part of the meeting is with the gas and electric. Uh, we have a couple orders in the in copy of the minutes that were referred to this committee, which is a begins with item 4A, a memo from uh, Jim Lovell regarding and a copy of the pilot agree, agreement itself is 4B in the minutes of the gas and electric, followed by an order by Councillor Murphy that I think we should just we'll do uh, after we get through the pilot agreement. Okay, motion to take a 4A, B, and C. Motion I second, second the motion. Four A, B, and C. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion to Aye. allow the uh, the manager and uh, I don't know Mr. Beauregard's title, but Mr. Beauregard to address us. Second. Motion made and second to allow Mr. Laval and Mr. Beauregard to address us on these matters. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Jim Bryan, thank you for joining us. Uh, Jim, could you lead us into the pilot agreement? Um, we know this was recently the renegotiated by the city uh, where we stand. Uh, I know Councillor Sullivan had initiated a couple of orders as to uh, getting this renegotiated. I'm sure Michael will want to weigh in after we hear from, from you and Brian, if we could. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the mayor's office approached us, uh, I guess, around the first of the year asking if we'd be willing to negotiate a new pilot agreement. We agreed. Um, at that point, the mayor's office indicated they were looking for a number close to what the streetlight budget deficit uh, was projected to be at that time, around $100,000. So after a little back and forth, we uh, agreed to uh, an adjustment of the pilot to of $113,629 a, a year. So the, the new pilot um, amount is $1,194,569. That was to be effective for FY 2020. So we made a one-time adjustment uh, to pay the 2020 portion of the uh, negotiated increase. And then beginning in uh, July, we began the um, adjusted payments so that we've been going along with the um, agreed upon pilot amount since then. Thank you. Just, just remind me, when's the last time the pilot agreement was uh, was amended? I believe it was 2009 or 2008 uh, prior to that. It was about Actually, a, prior to your time? Uh, no, it was during my time with, uh, I, I believe, Mayor Sullivan. Okay. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Councilor Sullivan. Uh, yes, and... Uh, I, I don't um, want uh, any of the hg &E commissioners or, or Mr. Lavelle to uh, take this in the wrong way, um, but I, I think this ag agreement is um, highly flawed, um, and, and I have quite a few issues with it. Um, you know, first of all, it was negotiated uh, by Mike Bloomberg, a um, uh, administrative assistant for the mayor. Um, and just reading from what he sent us on April 30th, right, that this agreement was pending final paperwork and signatures. Um, and the mayor will notify you once the paperwork is done. That was on April 30th. And so here we are um, in, in January of the following year, just seeing this for the first time. Um, 
I still believe that any agreement of this nature requires council approval. Um, my, my basis on that now also comes from the documentation we have here in front of us provided by HG&E. If you look at the, um, the internal correspondence we have from Mr. Lavelle, if you go about halfway down the page to line item number two, um, uh, the payment or a portion of it um, of the pilot is the hydro asset based pilot established in 2001 by agreement with the city council. Now, here is a pilot negotiated and agreed to by the city council. And then it comes something that the council approved then comes back in front of us, no no council approval. Uh, that's, that's number one. Number two is evaluations that were used um, by Mr. Bloomberg, right? Are, are assuming some values um, as far as the assets go that may have been true in 2001. They, they may have changed a bit by 2008, but to base it on a consumer price index, right? To me seems just absolutely foolhardy and without any basis. What we're looking at today in this day and age, when everybody's looking at the size of your carbon footprint, a big move towards green energy, sustainable energy, the use of renewable resources, that these assets have gone up tremendously in value to what they have, may have been 10 or 20 years ago. So to, to base it on uh, CPI is a combination uh, of apples and watermelons, if you will. Um, so also the number he, he arrived at, the 113,000 is based only on the base pilot and not on the hydro assets, all right? Which, which is the other big portion of it. Um, so this, and then the, the whole thing continues to devolve from there. Um, no, nobody anywhere, um, and, and I've checked with the uh, law, uh, law legal department. Um, I, I haven't had a chance to check with the clerk, but going back to find any copies of any of the original agreements. So um, I'll let it go for that and see where everybody else wants to continue with this, but. Um, uh, that, that that's all I have to say for right now. Any further discussion, Jim? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if I may, through the chair, Councilor Sullivan, just a couple of clarifying points. Uh, the first point you made referring to item two there, where it said by agreement of the city council, I think that may have been by informal agreement. I don't think there's an official document, but I do recall being in front of the city council asking for the approval to acquire the assets and there was some, a lot of uh, concern about, uh, you know, the tax base and the, the city did not want to, you know, go backwards. And there, there was a commitment made by Holyoke Gas and Electric at that time that we would pay the commercial equivalent tax rate uh, in the form of a pilot. So I, I don't think that was ever boiled down to pen and paper, but that's- I, that Jim, I, I know it wasn't. And that's, part, uh, that's also part of the problem. We're still basing something uh, on a, you know, 12 year old valuation and a tax rate that's, you know, was was based at 37 when we're at over 40 right now. Right. So, and all I'm saying, what I'm saying here is we we, we really need to get some of these formal for, form, formalized and uh, in a state where it just doesn't crop up every once every 10 or 20 years like, like this. And then number one, the, the you know, as, as far as the use, the uses for the, for the city, for the general fund, uh, where we go without it for 10 or 20 years, or then as it comes as a shock to the HG&E, uh, as a, as a big increase all at once. So th that's all I'm saying here is, and I, I don't think this, even what we have in front of us right now goes far enough. And I, I still want to stand by the fact that, as you just stated, it was H that negotiated this with the city council, not not with an administrative assistant to the mayor. Councilor um, Barley. Oh yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman. Let me just correct this. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, I'm just going to point out a couple things, and I, then I just want to ask uh, the manager a question to the chair, if I may. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm very grateful that that uh, that we have Jim Lavelle and Brian Beauregard on on our team. They're they're just a real credit to the uh, city of Holyoke. Never, I know they work for the ratepayers. I get it, but you know, let's just say credit to the city of Holyoke because they they really represent the city uh, in a um, in a first-rate manner, and and so I'm 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 very appreciative that they're on on uh, on our team. <clears throat> the um, I'm also grateful to Councilor Sullivan, if I may, uh, Mr. Chairman. I don't I don't like to invoke anybody's names because that's not the uh, rules. But it, it was Councilor Sullivan's initiative for this. Um, th there's there's no other way around it. It, it was Councilor Sullivan who 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 who, who even started this process. Um, you know whether it's this number or a different number, so so there there there, there should be some credit where where, where credit's doing, and I know we don't do a whole lot of that around here, but uh, I'm I'm going to point it out anyhow, and uh, um, so there, there's that. Um, just through the chair to to the manager, uh, in in your mem in your memo of April 29th, 2020, that that I that I, or an initial correspondence, let's say memo on it, but it says in the last paragraph. The mayor's office initially requested an increase of 254.4 to the pilot, but after some discussion, it was agreed that the increase should be based on adjusting the base pilot of 650, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and ultimately, it, the last sentence says, well, we, we got to a 17.5% increase of the base pilot for an annual increase of the aforementioned 113.629, which is great. Um, but how do we, how, how was the number 254.4 derived? And then how do we get to, you know, how, how do we get to the number we ultimately arrived, arrived at? So how, what does a 254.4 represent? Maybe that's the best way to put it, Jim. I, I believe the way the discussions initially started, you know, they gave us a target um, of the $100,000, which is a streetlight budget deficit projection. So. Uh, Mr. Beauregard and myself started looking at, you know, the hydro valuation and really, you know, what we've done is we increased the capacity of the hydro assets. Since we've acquired them, we've increased the capacity of the hydro assets. So we made an assumption, it's not an accurate one, but we made an assumption that the increase in capacity would uh, be an increase in the valuation from what we uh, established in 2001, just to try to back into the $100,000 target. So that kind of got us in the ballpark. Uh, so I think the 250,000 number came from uh, the mayor's office using our number, the CPI adjustment, and a few other adjustments uh, as well, which uh, you know really, again, the assumption that the project has increased in value over time is it, it fluctuates because right now energy prices are in the tank, capacity prices are in the tank, um, you know, generating assets are not making any money right now. So, you know, if someone were to value these things today, it would be a lot different than it was in 2001. So a number of factors, I think, uh, got us to the 254. We had some back and forth and got to the number we ultimately agreed upon. Got it. Uh, okay, I, I, I think I heard what you said. I, you know, I'm not, this isn't the U.S. Senate here, so I'm just, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to, I'm just, I'm just reading your memo. So I, I, however you guys put, ultimately derive as a number and whatever methodology you use, I, I'm, I'm going to accept it. I'm not, you know, we're, we're not here to, we're, we're not, we're not sitting in judgment of you. That's, that's for sure. I just, I just wanted to get, get your take on it because I, I, at least now, if I may, Mr. Chairman, at least now we have something in writing, a, ra a, a rationale, if you will, uh, whether or not we accept it or, 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 or does, but at least we have something to explain how. Um, but my, my, my next question uh, through, through the chair to the manager, it, uh, when, when would this, when would this be, um, is there another, because this was, there wasn't a really a, a rational basis by which to, to get to this uh, point now. So, I mean, is there, is there something that we can, can use to trigger a, 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 a you know, biennial or a whatever, some kind of review on, on this? Uh, I don't know if you and Mr. Beauregard want to address that because it, this just kind of came up out of thin air, uh, if you will, just, just through a Councilor Sullivan. Um, at least that's, how, that's my interpretation. So is, is there something we can do to perhaps um, look at this more on a more regular timetable? We're willing to do that. I mean, we would like to have it be 
based on some, you know, reasonable, you know, tricks. Uh, again, we, you know, we have to sit in front of our credit rating, rating agencies every year. And, and, you know, this is always one of their big concerns is, you know, they don't want an arbitrary process for the pilot because it works against us from a credit rating standpoint. No, okay, so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want an arbitrary process. Uh, that's the, the and, and reasonable metrics. I, I tell you what, that's, that's, I can tell you're a UMass grad. I, I know how you got in there, Jim, because you're smart. How I did is, it's still beyond my comprehension. So the big question is how you guys got out of there. I, well, it only took, it, it took, well, my mother made me graduate. Let me tell you that for, for, let me tell you for a fact. I didn't want to graduate. Um, uh, but after seven years, she said, you know, would you get a diploma? I said, I said, fine, ma. Uh, so, uh, uh, so that, that being said, uh, uh, you know, if, if I, let's, let's leave it at, at, at vague terms. So is that something that's through the chair to the manager? Is that something that perhaps the commissioners and you can revisit and then, then, you know, we, we get, we get all your minutes and, and we read them. So perhaps in a, in a year or two, you, you, you maybe you would anticipate revisiting that and, uh, and so it doesn't uh, upset your um, your your credit rating or 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 any kind of other metric, uh, Jim. I think that's reasonable, Councillor. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Bartley. Uh, before I recognize Councillor Sullivan, Jim, just uh, two things. Um, one, does the pilot in this renegotiated pilot have any in, any impact on the ratepayer? Any yes. increased impact? Yes, I and mean, it becomes part of our operating expenses. So yes, it, it impacts the rates. Okay. And two, um, our administrative assistant, and I, I was going to bring this up, but Jeff uh, Anderson Berger did some research, uh, partly for the law department, partly for uh, some questions we've been asking about this boat on pilot agreements. And, and Mike Sullivan knows, you know, I, I've, I've heard pilot agreements, the GE, the Housing Authority, and different ones over the years discussed. I don't recall any votes with the exception of and we're going back a couple of years now when we had the the solar field pilots before us which to me i thought was something more specific to the solar field and them being so new um it is some link to that that the solar field pilots were voted on in the beginning by the city council i think there was even discussion about that when they first came before us yeah, I think I honestly don't have a real good understanding of how we we got there. I think there was uh, some concern on the part of certain city councilors that wanted to make sure that there was some consideration. Um, the first solar projects were on HG&E property, but they were owned by private developers, and everything after that is privately owned, so they're they're non-municipal. So we are actually trying to work with the city to make sure that the city got something out of all these projects um, in the form of property tax or in lieu of. So um, the, the reality is if you tax the solar project at the going commercial rate, none of them would have been built. So we were at the table trying to make sure that the city got something uh, and that these projects still went ahead um, and, and the city would be better off in the end by you know something's better than nothing type of approach. Councilor Sullivan? Yep, thanks. And once again, Jim, you've done an excellent job of negotiating on, on behalf of the HG&E. Um, I, I think you were up against a lightweight. Um, so just in regards to a, a question asked previously about the 100,000, um, how that would affect the rate users, okay? Um, and, and you answered that very diplomatically. Yes, it's part of your over, it becomes a part of your overhead that does affect the rate users. How much does a $100,000 increase in the pilot affect the rate user? Does that move the needle even a fraction? A fraction, a small fraction, yes. Every uh, dollar in expense, counselor, would, would, would move the needle. And, and what, what thin portion of a penny would that move it if you weren't showing a surplus already this year, I mean last year. I don't have my calculator in front of me, but you know, a hundred thousand dollars. You know, on a. What was your surplus? What was your surplus last year? 
Um, actually, we won't have a surplus in 2020. What was it last year? Prior year was around five, but that a lot of that had to do with investment. Uh, five. Five million. million. Yeah. Thank you. Again, that funds our capital program. Yep. And before, as you also mentioned, the valuation of energy assets, you know, you're using a national average of energy assets going down. And those ones that are dragging it down include the coal and nuclear facilities and oil facilities and other dirty ones. But if you singled out the use of, as we mentioned before, assets like Hoyocas that are 90, 90%, uh, whatever, 85%, based on renewable energy, green energy, sustainable energy, a lower carbon footprint, wouldn't it be fair to say those have gone up in value? Yes and no. In general, I think yes, but in our specific instance, no, because one of the th one of the attributes that made those assets valuable to Hoyle Gas and Electric was the fact that we, prior to this climate bill, have been able to sell the renewable energy credits to make, you know, provide additional value to those assets. With the new energy bill, we're not able to um, sell those credits anymore and still claim that energy as renewable. So that's a hit to us of a million dollars a year. Well, that in itself is, but even still, the value of assets that are not coal-fired, nuclear-fired, other uh, oil-fired and stuff like that, those themselves have got to have gone up in value compared to the others. I would agree that there, yeah, the, the trend for coal and nuclear is in the downward uh, trajectory, whereas the others I think are flat, maybe slightly upward. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Jim. You're welcome, Counselor. Is there any further discussion from the committee or from anyone? Uh, barring the question, which I believe the law department is researching, there's not much more for us to talk about. No one gets the joke here, huh? Uh, uh, I, I, I got it. Take that four, sounds good. Four D off the table, Joe. Mr. What's Chairman? that? Well, Second. Just take Second four, four D off the table, Mr. Chairman. Yes. If we can just A, B, and C, if there's nothing further, we can complied with. Motion uh, complied, complied with. with. Complied. Yeah. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So moved. Motion to take 4D off the table. Motion and second to take 4D off the table. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. Introduced by Councilor Murphy that the mayor, purchasing director, as well as the manager of the Gas and Electric and others appear before the Finance Committee to discuss any current plans regarding the expansion of the electric vehicles within the city fleet. Do we have specific plans in terms of how many, of what types of vehicles, as well as when we might be doing this? Do we have plans for having sufficient uh, rapid recharging stations? There are some reports which indicate while the initial investment might be greater, the long-term effect is, re is reduced fuel expenses, less carbon dioxide emissions, in some cases, vehicles that have longer use life lifespans. The motion is that we did take it off the table for discussion. Uh, maker of the order, did you want to weigh in? Yeah, if I, if I can. Thank, Murphy. You, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank Lori, thank Jim and uh, Brian for, for coming. Uh, I just uh, saw an article by the Tennessee Valley Authority, uh, which obviously deals with uh, energy and, and in um, the Tennessee Valley, obviously. Uh, and there was a lot of interesting points there, some things that I never thought about uh, one being that the potential cost while the initial cost might be greater the annual cost uh, eventually can be can be far less and obviously the environmental impact can be far greater and also they were working with uh, it sounded like municipal utilities and we have our own municipal utility in terms of providing uh, the charging stations that made it more palatable not only for uh, the agency to get electronic vehicles but also for uh, citizens who are looking to uh, become more green. I also have just from an environmental perspective and I keep looking and knowing the asthma cases that are in uh, the lower wards of the city certainly uh, whatever we can do and one of the things that uh, their report indicate that the electric vehicle produces 86 hundred fewer pounds of carbon a year 
than a gasoline powered vehicle. Obviously, we're trying to reduce carbon, and uh, I would much reduce in terms of vehicles than in terms of not getting a business because we don't have natural gas. Uh, they also indicated, you know, they're they're getting their charging stations are getting uh, faster and better, and uh, I know some of the concerns were from agencies that they needed to have long term capacity, and that seems to be improving, and that's why I wanted to have uh, the gas and electric to come. But I just wanted to see. I mean, I know we're talking about buying vehicles, uh, vehicles that are in, you know, driving around the city on a regular basis, if we can find a way to reduce the carbon footprint, if we can do it and uh, do it economically and also provide uh, through the gas and electric uh, charging stations that would uh, provide some revenue there, but also provide a, a reduced uh, expense for recharging for, for our consumers. So those are the three things that I was looking at. Uh, again, I read the article. I, I I definitely thought it was interesting that their their long term costs are less, and the environmental impact are, are great, and that they were working with utilities throughout the Tennessee Valley. And I thought that's another uh, with our home our home oil, gas, and electric. I thought that potentially was another home run. So that's that's my goal, and I just want to get some information on it, see what the city is looking at doing, and. Uh, how advanced we are in terms of going to electric vehicles. Okay, thank you. Uh, before we turn it over, Council Leahy. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I just want to, through the chair, I just want to give big props to Jim Lavelle and his uh, his crew. Um, I just recently bought an electric car, and uh, you know, Terry, I, I'm trying to reduce my carbon footprint, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think my weight is uh, pushing the carbon foot down. Down. Uh, I'm not sure if that's working at all. But nonetheless, the Hoyle Gas and Electric, and I didn't know this until I bought one, um, has fantastic programs. Uh, one of the things is they provide um, a, a charger for your house. And so if you um, charge your car after 11 o'clock, you also get a discount per, per month as well. Um, so I just want to speak on the consumer side uh, that I think it's nothing but fantastic. And I just want to give you know Jim Lavelle and his crew um, you know all the kudos that I can. Um, but secondly, the price for the vehicles are pretty expensive. Luckily, when I purchased, I was actually just getting an oil change and they were offering a $10,000 federal um, uh, deal and also a $1,500 state deal. And so the way I looked at it is uh, it could be cheaper if I just bought an electric car. And I mean, was extremely surprised when I came home and said I went for an oil change and bought a car. Um, <laughs> she wasn't happy about that. But nonetheless, um, I just want to give props to Jimmy Lavelle and his crowd. Thank you. That sounds like a good lead into uh, Mr. Lavelle. Jim, would you like to uh, give us an update on where we are? Brian, I'm suing Brian's here for this too. Yes, thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, and and Councilor Leahy, thank you for the kind comments. And uh, Councilor Murphy, I uh, just want to say that. Jim, um, can I ask you to talk a little? I'm ha I have a hard time hearing this. If sure. you don't mind. So, Councilor Murphy, thank you for uh, bringing this subject <laughs> up. Um, he just wanted you to repeat that. <laughs> no, no, I, I couldn't hear him. <laughs> he, he, he's older, you have to humor him. So. That's right. <laughs> we would agree with the basic uh, takeaways from the TVA uh, article, and we've been very interested in trying to uh, convert our fleet at the gas and electric to alternative fuel. Um, unfortunately, to date, we don't have a lot to show for that in the form of, you know, converted vehicles or, you know, charging stations uh, for our use or others' use. But... Um, in, in a moment, Mr. Beauregard will explain to you what he's done in, in our team and uh, what we call our green team uh, in the form of just trying to put a plan together to start converting our fleet. And we anticipate that starting in 22, we will, the, the, the real problem right now is limited supply for our use vehicles. So we have medium heavy duty vehicles take up a good chunk of our fleet. And the what's available right now doesn't meet our needs, but we're anticipating uh, by 22, the supply is going to start to meet our needs. And so between 22 to 25, we expect that 20% of our fleet will then be converted to um, alternative fuel vehicles and mostly electric. Uh, we've also, over the past year and a half, as Councilor Leahy mentioned, been laying the groundwork for um, developing incentives uh, and educating uh, consumers 
uh, and trying to put a plan together, also get infrastructure for our use and for other city departments, anticipating that they'll be following suit. So uh, if it's okay with, with the chair, I might ask uh, Mr. Borgart to talk a little bit about the uh, electric vehicle plan that he's put together. Absolutely, we always welcome Brian. Brian, okay. the mic is yours. All right, thank you. I've never gotten this long, uh, this quiet. Uh, so <laughs> I actually look forward to talking. We have uh, a Zoom stopwatch, don't forget. We got a kickoff yeah. coming, Brian. Yeah, <laughs> well, the kickoff is already kicked off. <laughs> so, so really quick, um, in 2009, the city of Hoyoke um, became a green community. And when that process started, um, Hoyoke Gas and Electric in the city developed a, uh, a fuel efficient purchasing plan um, for increased miles per gallon based on um, different vehicle uh, weights. And our team has been calculating all emissions and all energy use for the entire uh, municipal sector. So not just the city, the schools, the gas and electric, the water department for, for, every, for all of our buildings and our transportation fleets. So what, what, what really transpired over the last 11 years is that each of the departments, and we've been tracking it, have been procuring vehicles that are the highest efficiency uh, gas or diesel version. So we were tweaking, paying an extra thousand dollars for a vehicle and getting an extra two to four miles uh, per gallon uh, out of that. Um, since 2018, as part of Hoyle Gas and Electric's procurement plans, we have been putting onto our uh, specifications electric vehicle equivalents. And like what Jim said, what we've been getting back is the manufacturers, and, and, and we try to stay with the local dealers, so we're looking at the Fords and the Hyundai, and we're, we're looking at mostly for our light duty fleet vans, um, pickup trucks, SUVs. Um, we require all-wheel drive or, or four-wheel drive, which has been a major limiting factor to um, electric vehicles and their acceptance. Um, it, so what has happened is the biz we were getting back was the, the Marquette Fords and other dealers and, uh, that were basically putting on the third party modifications to incorporate electric vehicles. The economics and the, the viability of those solutions, as Jim said, just have not gotten there yet. Um, we, um, in 2020, uh, we developed a electric vehicle strategic plan which kind of layered off of stuff that uh, Jim uh, uh, Lee, he, you had just mentioned earlier about the programs that we really started in 2019 and started to fast pace it through. So that strat strategic plan not only looks at oil, gas and electrics own vehicle fleet and the city fleet, but looks at our customers and the programs that we can we can employ and, and we can develop. As Jim did say, we are looking and seeing that in the light duty area and in, in some of the area of the medium uh, duty, getting into pi uh, pickups and uh, SUVs, we have seen that there has been an announcement by the major manufacturers like the Fords and the Hyundai that are gonna have different first generation units that are gonna be coming out between 2022 and 2025. Um, that could meet some of the municipal and uh, oil, gas, and electrics requirements. As of this time, for the utility level, heavy duty vehicles like our bucket trucks, our large cargo vans, um, our, our dump trucks, you know, similar to the city, there are a lot of beta tests and a lot of, um, um, you know, we're, we're weighing in, we're looking at these. We do not see currently comparable vehicles that have the same power and torque requirements that um, are, are affordable in these other vehicles. But we're keeping them on our radar. Uh, we are looking to uh, develop the programs we already have for the citizens uh, and, our, and our customers is we established an EV outreach program 
We have a, a, a separate website um, that gets into all the electric vehicle information for our customers. Many might not know uh, there is about 60 all electric vehicles within the city of Hoyoke, and uh, we have about 10 of those customers have obtained a, a free charger from us, and um, they are on our program uh, where we're offering them an additional $10 uh, discount per month so that they can not charge their vehicle during the peak hours of the day when the cost of energy is very expensive, but instead to do that um, you know, during the off-peak hours. Um, that's, that's starting to get the, the, word, the words out. For non-commercial type of vehicles, yes, there are programs that are available. We're incentivizing those things. To get to the municipal fleet, I think we're gonna see a lot of that over the next two to four years. Uh, uh, Councillor Murphy, you asked the question in regards to the charging stations. So today in the city of Hoyoke, there's about eight charging stations that are scattered uh, throughout the city. Um, Hoyoke Astro Electric was directly involved with putting um, some of the first uh, level two charging uh, stations um, um, uh, at the Hoyoke Mall. Um, we have a level three charger that is at the uh, Pioneer Valley tra uh, Transit, uh, the PVTA's facility uh, for an electric uh, bus. Um, and we know that strategically to work on the city fleet and the Hoyoke Ashton electric fleet is we need to determine where the proper location to charge these vehicles are. You know, is it a centralized location like the fuel depot? Probably not because it's gonna take a certain amount of time. So it's either gonna to have to be at strategic locations where they can be charging when the, uh, the city employees are um, you know, doing certain activities so that people aren't standing around. So we are going to be working directly with the city uh, to come up with solutions. Um, one of the problems with getting the charging stations is they had the material portion of the cost was reimbursed by the state, but none of the labor and none of the installation costs were. Just recently, the state has increased um, their, their grant availability for uh, charging stations, and that is something that we have actively placed uh, within our 2021-2022 strategic plan in order to uh, work to identify locations um, within uh, the city of Hoyo. Uh, we are hopeful, we uh, have been working with Electrify America that we can locate uh, a nice large charging station somewhere up uh, in the vicinity uh, uh, of the Hoyoke Mall near Hoyoke Crossing, somewhere out in, in, in that area. Um, and, um, um, you know, that, 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 that's, a, that's our background at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, we have one counselor's hand up. Lori, did you have anything to add? I know you're here on this order. Yep. I don't. Okay. And Councilor Barley. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you. Uh, I just want to make a couple of quick comments, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Then I'm, I have a couple of questions for Mr. Beauregard. Um, my first comment is through the chair to my friend, Councilor Leahy. When he hit, when he had the eleven thousand five hundred, it's almost as though he hit the lottery. So <laughs> I, I just wanted to point that out to my friend Jimmy. Uh, also through the chair to the to the manager, I, I I gave several compliments too, and I don't remember being thanked. And so now my feelings are hurt. So I just want you to, I just want the manager to to know that on the record. Um, the um, but he's known me so long when I when I almost flunked out of UMass. So he's he's known me since that days or beforehand. Um, now uh, to uh, Mr. Beauregard, uh, what, what is your title? Electric superintendent. All right, superintendent. Okay, thank you. I, I'm sorry, uh, Brian. I just okay. I, did, I just want to write that down because I we're not supposed to say names, but but in this case we'll we'll say Brian and Jimmy. Um, the the, um, the the thing about the uh, but first of all, I learned a lot right there so I, uh, thank you to Councilor Murphy for filing this order I, I I took a lot of notes here and and I, I just have a just a question or two on the on the specific location how, first of all, how long does it take to charge a vehicle just 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 a vehicle a sedan like Mr Leahy has for example so, so standard standard uh, vehicle charging would use the uh, 120 volt outlet you know in, in in a home and that that would take 
depending on the size of the vehicle, the size of the battery, uh, anywhere from eight to 20 hours. Uh, so it's typically you're, you're, you're powering uh, during, the, during the night hours. Um, now, because of that, there's level two charging, uh, which is the type of chargers that we've been providing that are typically installed uh, either inside or near the garage. And that's a 240 volt uh, uh, outlet. Uh, and that will take uh, anywhere, we'll, we'll call it four to six hours. Um, My, mine does uh, it about three, three and a half. Okay, so it, yeah. it's really dependent on the on the size, um, but the difference on, the difference there is that that extra fast charger electrically is about a seven seven and a half uh, kilowatt uh, load, whereas the level one charger that is from the one twenty volt is about one point two kilowatt load. Oh the major difference and like what is at the PBTA, they have a four, 480 volt uh, faster charge. And now you're looking at the same vehicle, uh, your vehicle during, uh, under that scenario, depending what the juice is in the battery at the time can be up to as long as nine, 90 minutes. So even if you were gonna put a centralized fast charger if you're coming from zero relative to the technology that exists today, it could still take up to 90 minutes. Now, for some of the city fleet, you might only need to utilize a battery for, uh, utilize the vehicle for 20, 20 miles during a day. And for that, these batteries charge much faster when they're between 20 and 80% and they charge much, much slower when they're between zero and 20 and 80 to 100. And that's to protect the lithium ion design of the, uh, of the battery system and not degrade it uh, over time. Thank you. Okay, that's, uh, well, and, and so, I mean, I'm just wondering if, if that's the case, it, it, the, the technology isn't exactly like uh, uh, even close to pumping gasoline at a, at a gas station. And so even if you, if you have these stations somewhere in a, at the mall or somewhere, I mean, what, and who, who's, who's gonna do that, Brian, right? I mean, if you, if you, if you put these various stations at the mall, I mean, you, you can't leave your car there or for, 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 four, for three or four or five hours, right? Uh, I mean, is there, what, what's, I mean, we're, you know, what, what, I mean, you've got these stations around the city. I mean, how, how often are they used right now? Are, are they the, the, uh, the, the level two stations, if you will, are, are they uh, the one by the people's bank? Is that, is that, uh, or here, whatever it's called up uh, yeah, people's bank up by, by the mall. What, how often are these things used? So those things are typically utilized for the lent for if somebody is stopping at the mall and they're going to be in the mall for an hour. They're, they're charging their vehicle. So if the vehicle pulled in and the vehicle was at a 25% level charge, that's a level two charger. Um, um, and if it was going to typically take three and a half hours to charge that car, it's now going to be, you know, somewhere about 60%, uh, you know, juice on the car. So now it can leave and it can go a farther distance. Oh, oh, so, so you don't have okay, oh, okay. So, so you that, do not have to. You do not have to charge the the, the vehicle to a full capacity. In fact, okay. the recommendation usually to have less degradation is to try to keep the state of charge between twenty and eighty percent. Okay. Then my last comment, Mr. Chairman, is to just to to chair to, to Brian. So I, I, we we just passed in this uh, in another committee um, to have uh, another development be across the street from Holyoke Crossing and. Um, Holyoke Landing, I think they're calling it, or if, if I'm if I'm wrong, I'll I'll get you the correct information. But the but the contact people there, I'll, I'll tell you, they 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 seem like they are, you know, they want to be part of the community. So I'm I'm I mean, so they're they're going to be customers of yours down the road anyhow for for utilities. But I'm going to suggest that 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 would certainly be a a possibility. So you've got O'Connell's at Holyoke Crossing, and then this other company at Holyoke Landing. Uh, and then you've got um, our friends at the mall as well. So those are three different areas right there, which would be one, one that would be 
those are three most prominent shopping areas. I'm, at this point, I mean, I, I'm, I may be wrong on that, but I don't think I am. And then, and then that would also be another way to advertise. So instead of just having station way out by, uh, you know, People's Bank, if you're, if, you know, I mean, that's a hike from that location to the mall. I mean, you probably have to take a, probably have to take a PVTA bus to get there from. Well, that's not true, but it, it's a hike. And so I'm just going to say that that th those might be th three more prominent locations um, that for you to consider. Thank you, Councilman. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, yeah, as Brian was saying, um, when I go up to, if I if I decide if I'm up in the Northampton area and I stop at Big Y uh, grocery shopping, um, this is kind of to answer uh, one of David's question, Councilor Bartley's question, is I'll charge as I'm shopping. So like. As he said, I'll get probably about seven um, kilowatts, probably an hour or so. So if I'm in a big Y for maybe an hour or so, you know, that gives me, you know, enough juice to get home. And when I do fill up, I get probably about 700. So my tank probably costs me about $26. But I get between 650 and 700 miles before I have to fill up again. I mean, that's substantial. It's a substantial savings. Um, Brian, what is the um, amperage uh, for a person's house? I have mine set for 40. Is that correct? Um, yeah, that is that is probably that is probably correct because if you're if you're on a 240 volt um, uh, feed, uh, the equivalent would probably be a breaker up to 50 amps. Okay, so I could even go as high as 50 if I. Okay, all right. Um, just once again, fantastic program. You guys are doing a, a great job, and um, if you guys need any recommendations, send them my way. Thank you. Uh, so, Dahman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thanks for the great discussion, uh, Brian and Jim. Uh, really great, some great points there about the uh, the future of uh, of these vehicles and how we can uh, really truly uh, become a uh, a green city. Uh, even though it was started in 2009, I, I think we have some work to do. But uh, and I understand the uh, the reasons why some vehicles at this point you just can't get it doesn't make economic sense, but. Um, for the local citizens or for anybody that's thinking about purchasing uh, electric vehicles, I think that's a great program to, to be able to help to help utilize uh, the, any kind of savings that people can get uh, down the road. But um, this is something that, uh, you know, solar, uh, you know, uh, electric, everything is, is, is changing rapidly. Um, so anything we can do to, uh, to even though the cost, the initial cost is, is very high, uh, the long-term cost and, and the savings, uh, uh, for our, our, our actually environment and our world is, uh, is, uh, should be considered number one. So uh, thank you for the discussion and I really appreciate your work. And Councilor Murphy. Thank, thank you again, Mr. Chairman and, and Brian and Jim, thank you. And, and Lori, thank you. And Lori, can I ask you, so <laughs> as the city goes through and, and is buying any vehicles, have you ever been encouraged to take a look at electric vehicles? Lori? I'm here. Um, I don't know if it's encouragement or not. I will say that the department heads are buying based on the cost. The and first, so, the upfront cost. Okay, so that's, you know, we've been really trying to just keep everybody, you know, watching and, you know, maintaining their budgets. Um, I would say that um, we do have a conservation director in the city and as we start, you know, I think there might be an opportunity to dovetail with HG&E and what they're doing because they're set, you know, they're, they're doing all of the groundwork and how can that get transferred on the city side, on the city side via purchasing, but I do know that um, out of our 235 vehicles, we have a lot of larger vehicles, you know, fire trucks, dump trucks, uh, transit vans, things of that sort. So as we look to go forward, um, I think everything just, it weighs on, you know, buying a vehicle like, you know, Councillor Leahy was able to save, what, 11.5 with incentives. So if a department right. like DW yep. or police, if those incentives aren't there, and I believe Brian 
had mentioned that the costs right now are are up there. You know, you're you're weighing um, the short term versus the long term. Yep. No, no, I appreciate. It. And I just, you know, I appreciate first of all that you know you're letting me know the the reason that we're not doing it. I would have, and I'm not trying to be critical of the mayor, but I'll probably end up being considered critical. But I mean, I would think with all the concept of, of green energy and everything that we're trying to do, uh, that this would have been something that we would look at both in terms of, yes, it's going to cost us more now, but for future years, we're going to be paying less and we're going to have a cleaner city. Uh, and, and again, I, I hope as we look at, and maybe with the conservation director and, and the new mayor coming in, as you look at it, Lori, that we're looking at I mean, certainly in terms of regular car vehicles or maybe SUVs, potentially we could be in a situation to start looking at some of these, uh, both as an environmental issue and also as an economic issue. I mean, I know I in, in this article, they indicated that they they viewed a thousand dollars a year savings in terms of maintenance costs uh, on the electric vehicles to the previous uh, expense in terms of uh, gas powered vehicles. So that was just something in their survey. Uh, Brian, if I can ask you, or I'm gonna make, I, and I appreciate your, uh, your your thoughts on the length of time it takes to charge. I know one of the, and one of the reasons I put down rapid charging, rapid recharging stations that they use in in Tennessee Valley was that those those are able to just about uh, create a, a full recharge within 30 minutes. And obviously, from a perspective of making it more convenient. Uh, the other thing that they talk about was, and they actually have a ratio, and you, I don't know if this is something that makes any sense, but it was from the International Energy Association that for every 10 uh, electric vehicles, there they would suggest that there be one charging connection. Uh, so, I mean, again, I'm, and the other aspect, obviously from my ward, <coughs> Any of the, any of the, or I would say a vast majority of the residents in Ward 2 would need uh, to be going to charging stations at the mall or, or wherever else. So, I mean, I think the more places that we can have them, uh, the more convenient it is, the more potential that more people will, in fact, go to electric vehicles. I mean, right now, for me, I could not recharge. If I got an electric vehicle, I'd have to go to Jim's house to recharge it. Uh, More than welcome. Oh, I don't think you want me there at midnight, Jim. I just don't want you talking all the time, but you're more than welcome to come over. <laughs> all right. I'll keep that in mind. But again, I just, and I, my hope is that we start looking at this and, and as the economics become, uh, we compare, yes, it's going to cost us X number of dollars more this year, but in the next five years, we're going to spend less per year. The other aspects of the article indicated that the maintenance cost uh, was also less, and the longevity of the vehicles tended to be longer. And I don't, again, those are all part of this Tennessee Valley Authority uh, article that they wrote. So I'm assuming they're correct. But I just, you know, again, I'm just encouraging us to take a look at becoming as green as we can uh, within our economic ability, but also to make uh, it, po it possible for, for people who don't own their own home and, and don't have the ability to charge it that they're going to have easy locations to go ahead and recharge your vehicle. So thank you very much. And I appreciate everyone's time. And I just hope we can move on this uh, at some point to uh, start expanding our electric uh, ve electric vehicle fleet in the city. And then uh, and set example by having more charging stations for the city. Thanks, Mr. Thank Chairman. you. Mr. Uh, Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Council Green. Yes, uh, quickly, uh, just a, a quick uh, question to Brian. Uh, with the electric vehicle, what is the uh, life of the, the battery in the electric vehicle and what is the cost of replacement and how many miles can you expect to get out of one battery? If I could answer that uh, through the chair, um, I have a lifetime warranty for the battery. So you'll never have to replace the battery? No. If, if when it comes time that I have to replace the battery, there's a warranty for it. So um, I was told um, that I'll get a new one. What's the, well, I, I can't get into the make of the vehicle, but uh, that's that's very interesting. That's, I, I've never heard that before. So they guarantee 
that if the battery is if the battery wears out, they replace the battery at no cost. What I was told when I was signing the papers. Oh, okay, thank you. Councilor Sullivan, then uh, Jim, I see your hand up, Mr. Lavelle. Okay. Yep, uh, I really want to thank Jim and Brian for all we've heard here tonight. Um, especially what I'm hearing now about electrical vehicle replacement plans uh, in the city, strategic planning, especially where they're interacting with other departments, the homeowner incentives. Um, I've heard about pursuing other useful grant, use, useful grants and partners. Um, it, it's just amazing. This this really confirms my confidence in our local people, especially after we just had a group come in composed of people from Amherst, Northampton, Malden, Florida, and Connecticut from this Bar Foundation, who, and, and might I add, supporting them, certain city administrators who mustn't have had the same confidence as the, the rest of the council here did in our local uh, oil, gas, and electric, who, whose sole real intention is to go about and dismantle and destroy these uh, uh, local municipally run utilities. And, and to see we've got such a great, great thing going here, it just really confirms uh, the, the action we took uh, regarding this uh, Bar Foundation grant and uh, really, as I said previously, really confirms my confidence in the confidence in the team we have to help lead us to the future and continue on the path where we've already undertaken. Thank you. And to our uh, our manager, Jim. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick comment: uh, the web electric vehicle website that uh, Brian referenced earlier has some good information about. Um, electric vehicles and uh, incentives at all different levels. And Brian also didn't mention what he and his team did, what they worked with the local dealers at Ford and uh, Hyundai to train those dealerships on all the incentives and everything else. So if our you know residents are walking in there, they now have an educated resource to help them through the purchasing process for a alternative fuel vehicle. So we're gonna keep working with the local vendors to try and uh, channel our customers into their shops. I want to uh, thank everyone for uh, for this conversation, this discussion, and I took some good notes as uh, Councillor Bartley's chair of DGR taught me to do. But I want to. I just want to note one thing, just one highlight. Brian, thank you for for reminding us that you've had not only has Hoyok been a green community, you know, since 2009, but that you've had this your your team, but this team in place over the past 11 years working on these issues. That, that, that's a great reminder, but an incredible story. And hats off to the Gas and Electric, to your commissioners, and to everyone who has, who has made, made us one of the first green communities in Massachusetts. It's an incredible story. And uh, you know, I, I, I'll stop there because I just think it's something that we gotta not just remind ourselves, but remind the ratepayers and all the residents of Hoyoke. Mm -hmm. uh, to the maker of the order, did we feel that this order has been complied with? Yes. Chair, motion motion. Order with. Second. Motion made second. This order has complied with. Thank you again, everyone. We appreciate it. And all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So moved. Uh, real quick, for a couple reasons, I, I think we've done pretty good with this uh, aggressive agenda. But on item number, item number five, I introduced it that the city council meet with BBW superintendent to discuss the replacement of vehicles. I talked to uh, Mike tonight and he, he's, he does have something to report, but it might be a little premature. He is working uh, with the mayor and he is working with uh, coming up with some uh, funding ideas as to how, I think we all get in the phone calls on recycling, trash pickup and things. And part of the problem is, is our recycling trucks are shot and our trash vehicles we need, we're probably gonna need at least one more. But he, he's not ready to make the full report, but soon, and also a funding request that will be coming towards the city council uh, fairly soon. So I, I said, it makes no sense to bring you in tonight, Mike, knowing that our last uh, couple of, uh, couple of uh, discussions could take some time. And on Councilor item number six, Councilor McGee's order, uh, he is ready to, unfortunately, with, with the budget situation, you know, there's chapter 90s monies that are dedicated 
There's black grant monies that are always dedicated in this area. There is no budget monies you know, allocated this year. But we also have a third order, which is not is about ready to be on the table with the sewer Suez coming in before the city council. So Mike and I agreed that we would put this both these orders with Suez on a future, fairly um, near future uh, finance committee agenda. I don't want to make that report and just let you know Mike would have been available, but I think at this late hour it didn't make sense to have him come in. So okay, Mr. Chair, Chairman, then, yes, the, Council yeah, just, just motion to take seven off the table then? There a motion okay, at five and six we could just lay keep on the table. Yeah. Well, motion takes seven. Uh, aye. Aye. Motion takes seven off the table. Item seven. Make motion made and second take off the table for discussion. All those in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed introduced by myself on behalf of the the mayor and on behalf of the Hood Police Department that the city council accept the provisions of Mass General Laws Chapter 44, Section 53A, known as the Senator Charles E. Shannon Jr. Community Safety Initiative Grant and it authorized the establishment of a fund method appropriate for the accounting of said expenditures and resources of in, associated with the administration of said grant. Uh, we have Sergeant Hart with us as always. John's been very patient. Uh, he might have a score of the game for us, but we're not gonna put him on the spot. But uh, Sergeant 13, Hart. 7, Alabama. 14 seven Alabama. Thank you. Um, Just John, you. Could, you run, could you run this through us? Uh, First of all, is there any matches? Uh, second of all, this is a, a reoccurring grant on an annual basis for some time now, and we do have some partners out there in the community. And third of all, I, if I seem to remember in an email or a request, are you looking for a, a new um, account to be set up, or is that just, just the way of saying this year's account be set up? Sergeant Hart. Yes, thank you, Councilor, for having me again. And um, to answer your question, yes, every time we get a new grant, um, we get a new grant fund just to um, make sure that all our costs and expenditures and stuff go to the proper fund and uh, we don't co-mingle, which is against the law. Um, and to start off, <clears throat> um, it, it is no matching and Councilor Leahy can um, vote on this because it does go to the whole department. Um, so this is level funding. It's the Shannon uh, grant. Um, the total amount of the award, and it's a, a annual grant, and it goes the calendar year from January 1st uh, to December 31st. The total amount of the award is $475,000, 234 and 47 cents. The, um, the Hoyle Police Department will receive approximately 120,000 of that. 74,250 will go towards our gang suppression units. Um, approximately 42,000 will go for our um, MCP, uh, mobile community policing, and 300, or 3,000 rather, um, 3,800 will go for uh, administrative costs. Um, for the gang suppression units, that amount um, should get us approximately 45 um, patrols and approximately 40 uh, mobile community policing mobilizations. Um, the next uh, partner we have is the Boys and Girls Club of Holyoke. They'll be getting um, approximately 150,000 um, for all of their um, after school programs, um, the, the activities that take place in the other uh, housing authority sites, the satellite sites. Um, the next partner is Mass Hire um, for their uh, occupational training program. They're going to get approximately 42,686.80. Again, for their um, you know, job placement and, and uh, occupational training program. We also have the uh, YMCA, who are going to be receiving 35000 uh, for their uh, street outreach program. Um, the next 
partner is going to be Opportunity Academy. Um, that's 5500 That's for their loop, uh, youth leadership program and uh, a deve developmental program for teachers. Um, the next partner is the uh, Chickabee Boys and Girls Club. We're going to be receiving $81,000. $826.20 and they have um, uh, prevention programs at their Boys and Girls Club there and the Chickabee Police Department working um, with them um, and their Young Cadet Academies. The next partner is the Hamilton County Sheriff's Department. They're going to receive $18,224 uh, and again that's for the, our Hoyoke Youth uh, or Hoyoke Safe Neighborhood Initiative. Um, which does our uh, uh, basketball leagues and uh, the fun nights. Um, and also, um, we have the Holyoke Community College, $28,080. And they do the, uh, provide the um, uh, training and education for um, the high set, um, which go towards the uh, GED instructors. And uh, the Holyoke High School will be getting $23,800. Uh, for the restorative justice program. And that about wraps it up. Yeah, just a, a couple of quick questions. Um, we, you know, pretty much this is a reoccurring grant and, and, and you said level funded. And uh, I think most of these partners um, have been ongoing themselves. Yes. Yep. The same. Same. And, and mass hire. That's that's the uh, the former uh, career point. Career point. Okay. Um. I, I know, and, and I think we we all know that between the auditor, Melanson and Heath, and Division of Local Services, there's there's a lot of questions about deficiencies in grants. Um. And I think you you and and Tanya, our mm -hmm. auditor. And everybody has been working hard on trying to correct that. I, I hope the mayor is living up to a promise that he's going to get involved and, and work with that. Can I? Do you know that? Because I've asked in the past that money, especially the Shannon Grant, a lot of money is funneled to the city and goes out into the uh, out into the world. If there are deficiencies, the Boys and Girls Club, the YMCA, or any of these partners, is the city responsible for those deficiencies? Um, it, it, yes, it's a. This is a state reimbursement. So, so this grant, um, we get re. I don't submit reimbursements um, through expenditures. So the the state usually um, does quarterly reimbursements. Um, sometimes it it varies, which is why sometimes at the end of the year. Um, these state grants may show a deficiency when it's time to report um, for the free cash because the state didn't um, put in the, the, the reimbursement to offset the cost. So that number could get used um, towards the, the, the free cash number. However, the reimbursements come in. So I think some of the what happened in the past was um, Brian Smith would know this and wouldn't use that deficiency number uh, going forward. So that's um, kind of explains some of the um, state grants that don't get that, that get reimbursed, you know, quarterly as they as they uh, submit them, not as how we request them, um, which is the same for some of these grants that more than a year. Sometimes those de deficiencies at the end of the year won't or, or will be um, used towards that free cash. However, if, if it's a three-year grant, it really should because the grant's just going to keep continuing to do invoices and reimbursements and invoices and reimbursements for the next three years. So that's one thing to look at. And Tanya and I are talking about that on how we're going to um, move forward addressing those things. I just uh, I just love it, you know, because Melanson and Heath is obviously an independent auditor, you know, hired by the city to uh, as required to you know to work with us. 
the Division of Local Services, I call them DOR, is a state agency. And the state is, in, in some instance, instances, looking at deficiencies in the way they reimburse these, you know, carryover, you know, grants themselves. Mm -hmm. And then looking at us and saying, well, that's going to be less free cash for the city of Hoyle. It, you, you, you can code it any way you want, mm -hmm. but the state is trying to tell us that they want us to change our form of government, and they're using this as tactics to put us in a position to give in to something that would take away from our checks and balance. And in the meantime, costing taxpayers dollars, availability of dollars that could be used in what we call free cash for much needed services. And, uh, you know, 12 months ago, we all had DLS in, and all they wanted to talk about was a chief financial officer not being the mayor. Well, that's not our government. And and, and I, if Melanson and Heath doesn't see this, maybe it's time we get a new auditor, but that's, that's a different story, and I could be getting a little sidetracked here. But thank you for answering my question. The Shannon Grant is very important, not just to the city, but to all these agencies and I, uh, I'll stop there because I understand the importance of this and I just hope some people come to their senses as far as the rest of it goes. Is there any discussion? Mr. Chairman? Councilor Rainey. Yeah, I'd just like to ask Sergeant Hart, what's the restorative justice program at the Holyoke High School? Um, that's um, a, a program that's uh, internal. Um, it's run by um, uh, some some uh, high school staff, and it it uh, engage. They, they they meet and they uh, they talk about um, uh, different ways to decrease uh, suspension rates, improve the school climate, um, and increase uh, student uh, educational engagement. So they meet uh, often to to talk about various um, topics that, that are happening inside the school. Uh, can you elaborate on that or? Um, I thought I just did a, as far as the meeting um, to try and uh, resolve issues amongst themselves, amongst the students. So the students are doing um, uh, having meetings and, and, and discussing ways that um, they can work with other students to like decrease su suspensions. If a student gets suspended, maybe invite that individual into the meeting and talk about how did this suspension occur? What can we do to, to prevent it in the future? Um, and um, it's a good um, uh, program for the students to try and um, problem solve amongst themselves with with uh, kind of some direction from the staff there. Thank you. Councilor Tallman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Just briefly, uh, John, uh, you, you mentioned about the uh, the gang task force or the gang suppression unit. Um, you yeah. said how, many, uh, how many patrols on that? Uh, approximately 45. And, and on the community policing, you said, uh, is that the unit, the mobile unit? Yes. So you'll have that out there 40 times during the year? Um, yeah, we're, we're hoping to. Um, again, with COVID, we are restricted. Um, and we had to, actually, I had to send in an amendment um, because we couldn't have that out there and attract big crowds. So we amended that. And so it's still amended uh, moving forward um, to um, some of the bike patrols and the um, uh, walking beats that, that you've seen this past year. Okay, yeah, cause I, I, you know, I've, I've noticed a mobile unit out there previous to COVID, but I, I mean, not, you know, certain areas of hotspots, but not a lot. Um, right. I just want to make sure that if it's not going to be out there <clears throat> that much, that that money's utilized for either the bike patrols or the, the walking units, so we see more of that out there. I think that's important. Yeah, that's that's what we did there, and, and and it is important. It's really important that these patrols are out there because they supplement our regular patrol, and it's always good to have more officers um, out on the street. And 
These are run mainly on the weekends, Friday, Saturday nights, where um, crime seems seem to be at a high point. So it's good to have additional officers out on the yeah, road. Yeah, the, the, the more out there, the better. I like to see a lot of people out in the street, uh, you know, even some of the, not that I can, you know, say it would happen, but, you know, more people on the street, and less people inside, uh, I think would be better for our community. But uh, thank you for working on the grants. Appreciate it. Councilor Barley? Yeah, just, um, did, you know, only because you, this is just a point of order, I guess, Mr. Chairman, because since, since you raised the topic, because uh, we, we all got the email from, from Sergeant Fora too. I think every counselor got it January 5th uh, relative to, to the grant. So are, are, is the chair going to possibly have a separate order to, I mean, to discuss that email um, so we can maybe have a little give and take with Sergeant Hart or uh, Captain Pratt or Chief Fibo on that? Um, I mean, yes, it, 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 it had to do with the topic you, you just raised. Yes. Um, in, in any grant, I will bring up that topic every time there's a grant before us as a reminder to the uh, department who is getting a grant, whether it's reoccurring or new. But yes, we, we, I, we plan to have a meeting, both not just on the email, but on all the deficiencies. We're waiting for the, uh, you know, the, the email. Well, we have an email from Lance and Heath, and now we have an email, I believe, from DLS as to the uh, the configuring of this year's you know, lack of free cash. Um, it's, it's, I heard a number that uh, I was not, it was not the number that we heard around tax classification, but in that ballpark, it got a little bit worse. So yes, um, and we do have a list of all the deficiencies and we will be, uh, I do plan to have a, a meeting as we did last year. And unfortunately, when we did this last year, as I just stated a few minutes ago, the topic from DLS seemed to be nothing but the uh, proposal for the chief financial officer. There are still questions with the one person who stayed with us that we asked questions and still answers I think we're waiting for from 12 months ago. Well, maybe this year we'll get some better answers and some better understanding of this ongoing debacle. Okay, so I, I, I okay, I see Councilor Sullivan's hand up. I'm just gonna make a motion to approve, but I'll wait. Thank you. Councilor Sullivan. I just have um, one question, Sergeant Hart. Um, so when we put uh, officers out there, um, and we've heard on through several other of our previous meetings and different committees that quite often um, patrolmen decline uh, the overtime or the extra duty. Uh, once that happens, are reserves eligible to participate in money from the Shannon grant? Yeah, so so I, I know you, you've raised this question and, and we're all for getting the most bang for your buck and having as many patrols out there as we possibly can, believe me. However, we got um, uh, both union contracts which um, prohibit us from hiring a, a reserve before offering it first to any full-time officer or supervisor. So. If there's if there isn't if some slots can't be filled by an officer or a supervisor, then we can go out to uh, to the reserves to fill those positions. Right. Can I jump in on that, Mike? The, go ahead. Yeah, just you know, this this is the way it should be, John. And I think this is the understanding we need to get is that the slots for an officer is an officer performing the duties of an officer. The slots for a patrol is a patrol officer performing the duties of a patrol officer. So I agree, if there's an opening that you need a sergeant or a lieutenant to do a, a mobilization or to do something, you fill it in with the first come first serve from the officers. If you need a patrol officer to, for the mobilization and our regular patrol officers don't jump on it, then you go to the reserves, not the officers. Supervisors, right Joe? Supervisors. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I, I, I understand your point, um, but that's not uh, the way it goes. Uh, it's um, overtime for the supervisors um, is eligible the same way it is for uh, for patrolmen. You say my point well, had a lot of common sense to it or you just understood it? No, I, 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 I understood it. And, and again, we go back to that, 
um, more bang for your buck, but it, it's a it's a contractual issue. Um, same thing goes for um, uh, road jobs, you, you know, off duty. That's at a set rate, so it the bid goes out to a patrolman, and if the patrolman doesn't take it, a supervisor could, has the next um, option of taking it. Now a supervisor is still going to get that 45 or, or whatever the road job rate is, the same as a patrolman, but a reserve won't get that off-duty job unless a full-time officer doesn't take it. And that goes back to the reserve. So the order goes full-time, whether it be patrolman or supervisor, reserved, if none of the reserves put in for the job, it defaults to the auxiliaries. And that's why we're seeing auxiliaries doing the majority of the road jobs out there because that whole chain of command I just mentioned uh, did not put in for the job. Mike, sorry, I jumped in. Yeah, so I don't want to cloud the issue, John, by talking about the, the road jobs. In specific here, mm -hmm. I'm talking about the, right. the, grant, the grant monies. And if I'm to understand this correctly, um, it, it's the union contracts that we have in place right now is what is forcing us to use the grant money at for supervisors an $80 minimum plus rate instead of a reserve at $18 rate and therefore um, basically we're we're only getting 20 to 25% of the available hours, available feet time on the street, if you would, that we could get out of this grant money because of the contracts that we've entered into. Um, um, one, I can tell you that the $80 minimum for supervisors is way off. Um, we have supervisors in the, in the 60 range and the majority, I would say, um, is around um, 75% or $75 an hour for, well, for supervisors. I'm, I'm looking right at the numbers supplied by the treasurer's office, uh, specifically for the Shannon grant, which is uh, item code in the department 250. Um, mm -hmm. And when I divide those hours by the, by the uh, dollars um, earned, it comes out uh, to seventy-eight fifty, all right. Um, so, so, so what you're looking at there, what you're looking at there is, is not, it does not re represent the full um, supervisors' salaries. What you what you see there is those supervisors who volunteer to work or put in for that Shannon grant. So, uh, uh, some supervisors don't put in for, for that and don't want to work that detail, which may I, have a lot lower rate. So when I when I go out to uh, do a grant, the number I generally use um, is seventy five dollars an hour for a supervisor when I when I uh, budget for any type of uh, overtime patrols. Well, I won't I won't quibble about the seventy five or eighty dollars. Mm -hmm. um, uh, e either way, it's still a tremendous right. difference as to how much time we could have uh, coverage, if you would, out there on the street between that and an $18 rate. Uh, uh, and I I'm not trying to uh, s slash any anybody's annual income, but um, we we've got to also make as effective use out of this grant money as we can. And it it still seems like we're we're not uh, we're we're just not getting as 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 much useful time out on the streets as we could be out of out of this grant money. Yeah, I, I like I said, I, I understand um, where you're coming from and, and getting the most bang for your buck, but there are you know contracts that we have to abide by, and that's. Um, how we're doing things. So. Yep, I understand that. Mr. Riley. Yeah, I just just to just to 
to just to share, because um, I've, I've heard several times uh, uh, from from Sergeant Hart about the, the contracts, and but you know, Joe, I, I don't have the language in front of me, and it, it's just tough for me to. Um, uh, I, I, it, how do we get the language specifically to this issue, Joe? Uh, is that something we can? We that you know, I don't want to burden you, but m maybe could we ask the administrative assistant to uh, to get that specific language from the law department, to, just so we can have have the verbiage in front of us? No, absolutely. Um, so it's it's you know, contracts are kept. You know, the everything is kept by the uh, by the city clerk, but the law department certainly can get to the language a lot quicker. Jeff, I, I think you're listening. If if you could get us the superior officers and the patrol officers language specific to who has rights to uh, to first come first serve overtime um, grant grant jobs, I think is what we're looking at. Yeah, I can do that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll I'll make a motion to let's uh, uh, to. Uh, to recommend to the city council we approve the Shannon grant. I'll second that. Motion second that we recommend to the full city council we accept this year's Shannon grant. Is there any further discussion? Hey, All Joe. Those All those in favor? Joe. Uh, Joe. Joe. Mr. Chair, I think I heard Councilor Leahy. Councilor Leahy. Thank you. I just wanted to make it known that I'm also on the board of directors of the Boys and Girls Club. But as everybody knows, it's not a paid position and I donate my time there. I just want to let people know that. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? No. Nope. And the motion? All those in favor? Any aye, opposed? Aye. Five, aye. Five, then, uh, five to zero. Great. You want a motion to adjourn, Joe, or do you have anything else? I think that's it. All right, motion to adjourn. Motion to second to adjourn. Thank you, everybody. John, thank you again with everybody else that's been with us. We thank appreciate you. appreciate it. And uh, it's, uh, it's still the second quarter, and it's going to be a shootout. <laughs> it's 21-14, Joe. Thank you, Howie. I knew you were watching. Thanks, Howie. <laughs> well, I'm listening to you guys, too, but I'm watching the stream. Hey, that's oh, why I shooting the house with two ears and two eyes. <laughs> one ear and eye for Zoom, one ear and eye for the game. For the motion to adjourn, good night. I'll favor. Right. Thank, you. Right. Thank you again. Good night, good night, good night everyone. Night. Have a good night. Good night. Good night.